evening and welcome to the Thursday, September 13th, 2012 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I will uh, begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll call. Mayor David Darkwitz? Present. Mr. Alden Bourne? Here. Mr. Duvall? Present. Mr. Michael Flynn? Here. Mr. Downey Meyer? Here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lisa Minnick? Present. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Mr. Stephanie Quist? Here. Here. Present. Thank you very much. Um, we'll begin uh, this evening's meeting with our public comment period. Um, I believe we have a sign-up sheet, a sign-up list, um, and uh, and anticipating that we might have some more folks than normal. I, I have a three-minute timer tonight, just so that the speakers can actually see the time as well. Um, so uh, I would ask folks to come up and identify themselves, uh, identify where they live, and, uh, and please try to respect the three-minute time limit so that everyone gets a fair chance. Um, Jeff, you're the first speaker. I brought the newspaper, too. Je I'm Jeffrey Boob. I live down in Hale Apartments in Ward 3B. My concern is that all of the school committee, when we work this start time out, be coordinated with the rec department. I have a little qualm about the proposal three of starting the JFK at 740. <coughs> it is possible that if you check with the rec department, you may be able to have them alter the water aerobics time on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We cannot do anything to diminish the income coming in out of that aquatic center. It's self-funding. Other than that, I have no qualm. I think uh, 8.15 in the morning to 2.45, we can somehow tweak the swim team practice time so as not really to interrupt the rest of the aquatic center. It's more than just sports. It's more than just getting the students' classes at Smith. It's a coordinated effort with the rec department and the school department. I like the idea of the kids here in the middle school being able to take swim lessons, competitive swimming. Who knows? We may have a Missy Franklin kind of, of our high school. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, the next speaker signed up is uh, Suzanne Strauss. Hi, I'm a 15-year veteran teacher of English in Northampton High School and a teacher in Massachusetts for 22 years, as well as a parent of two high school students uh, currently attending Northampton High School, one a ninth grader and one a 10th grader. My experience with teenagers is pretty vast. I am in support of changing the high school start time for a number of reasons, and while I know it will not make everyone happy, I think it's the right thing to do. Here's why. First, I currently teach sophomores during first period, which begins at 7.30, and, seven, and second period, which begins at 9. There is a significant change in energy level and productivity between the two classes, as I have noted on early visits in front of this committee in the, in the past, with the students at 9 a.m. much more alert and on task. Second, when I greet students in the morning at 7.20 or so and ask how they're feeling, 90% will answer with a single word, tired. Third, while we have a fine high school, the fact remains that many students who attend struggle to pass classes and also struggle with anxiety, depression, and the like. Uh, I honestly believe that these students need more attention in many ways, but certainly getting more sleep is one easy way we can help them, and it is something we should do. Fourth. As someone who rides my bicycle to work and passes students waiting for the bus on the way, it will not be long before we're all out in the pitch dark. Of course, these students are not as vulnerable at 14 and 15 and 16 as students who are 10, 11, and 12, but they are children, and standing outside at 6.30 a.m. during cold, dark months is not okay and can be fixed. The difference between rising at 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. and starting school at 8.15 or 8.30 is huge. It may mean the difference between someone being able to walk to school, have breakfast, which many students admit that they just don't have time for, help out with siblings, prepare some notes for class, or finish an assignment. 
I know that my own children could easily wake up at 6 or 6.30 when they attended Jackson Street School, but now they say it's just hard for them to get out of bed. Their bodies just don't want to do it. Many bright, committed citizens of this city have worked for years on the reasons and the implementation plans for a revised start time for NHS. I think it's time to make the change. If we do that now, everyone will be ready to go next September. Thank you. The next speaker is Amy Mitrani. Hi, my name is Amy Mitrani. I live at Winterbury Lane in Florence. Whether or not to have a late start time is not just a question of budget or convenience. It's a question of public health. We don't let our children or teens buy cigarettes until they're 18 or alcohol until they're 21 because we as adults know that it's dangerous for their health. When teens begin to drive, we have very stringent, clearly defined steps for them to go through before they are completely independent drivers because we want to protect their health and safety. Likewise, the detriments of such an early start time has been outlined for this committee over and over again. Increase of depression, higher percentage of car accidents, lower test scores, higher absence rate. The benefits have also been pointed out repeatedly. Higher attendance, lower number of accidents, higher attendance rate. To not pass a later start time is irresponsible, negligent, and careless. To support a later start time is to stand up for the health and well-being of the youth in our community and in our town and to support our community into being the best it can be. It means our giving our teens the opportunity also to be the best they can be. It's a question of public health and it's the right thing to do. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Dr. K. Sakvitny. Hi, I'm Dr. K. Sock Whitney. I really hope this is the last time I'm going to be up here because you've heard from me a lot. But I'm going to try to say something that's a little bit different. I have in the past passed out this two page summary of the research on um, sleep and adolescence. Thank you. Um, and I'm happy to pass it on if anybody doesn't have a copy to give this to you. I, the research is so clear. We all know that. That's not what we're here tonight to discuss. I think. I am a clinical psychologist, a former high school student, and a parent, well, a former high school student, also a former high school teacher, and a um, parent of two high school age students. My daughter does have to catch a 6.30 bus. Um, she has to be out the door at 6.25 to catch the bus. I've said before, and I, but I want to reiterate that I feel so strongly, as the um, speaker before me did, that this is not a matter of opinion, that this is a call for leadership. It is a public health issue. It is an educational issue. The research is about how minds learn, as well as mood, as well as driving safety, as well as um, obesity, as well as all, all aspects of functioning. But it calls for leadership, not opinions. The point that I want to underscore today is the one that I think is made less often, which is that I believe that the late, a later start time is better for all students and that the loss of sleep is bad for all students. But I also think that it disproportionately burdens and harms students with learning differences. Our high school, the Northampton High School, already offers several extra challenges to students with learning differences. My understanding from a high school administrator is that one out of five students at the high school is either on an IEP or has a 504. <laughs> the model of the school, which includes the block system and 85-minute classes, is extra difficult for many students with learning difficulties and learning differences. The model that emphasizes finals where the finals are largely long, two-hour, multiple-choice tests covering large amounts of material disproportionately disfavors students with learning differences. There is a clear, enormous um, cut in the amount of resources and the number of staff available when students come from JFK to the high school. The SPED staff, the staff available to students is far fewer. So they're already going into a situation where there are extra hardships. And I would argue that the loss of sleep time 
disproportionately also burdens those students and that that's not fair. So I really urge you to support the change to at least an 8.15 start time and I thank you for the time and attention. Thank you. The next speaker is Corinne Clevidence. Hi, my name is Corinne Clevidence. I live on Orchard Street in Northampton. And I also hope this is the last time that I'll be standing up in front of you on this issue. Um, I have two students at JFK this year. And I very much support a later high school start time. I think it would benefit all students. I think that the benefits are clear. And it's really just a matter of finding something that will work for everybody schedule-wise. And I'm hopeful that this will finally be achieved. So I'm just here to say, um, please, please, please take action on this. Thanks very much. Thank you. OK, the, um, sorry, got some handouts here. The next speaker is Zach Dietz. Hi, I'm Zach Dietz. I live on 222 Elm Street. Um, so I'm a freshman this year at Northampton High School, and uh, I've talked several times about um, wanting a la later start time, and the reality didn't really set in for me until about eight days ago. So <laughs> walking you through when I woke up the first day, it felt like a brick hit my face. And when I came into school, I was talking with kids, and I heard that same expression from another kid, too. It's, it's a commonality. It feels horrible. In the shower, I was rocking back and forth, woozy, and that's happened several times. And I've compared this story with other people's stories, and it's the same thing. I have headaches throughout the day um, because of lack of sleep, and I've talked to other kids, too. They have the same thing. Um, Focusing in my honors geometry class at 7.30 in the morning is near to impossible. I, in my eight days, I've seen several kids already trying to um, get some sleep in class. And it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me to start school this early. So um, I, I realize that there's a drawback because of the JFK needing to switch their start time. But I'd like to note that Northampton students spend four years uh, in the high school and three years in the middle school. So um, it would benefit Northampton students more if the high school start time was made later, even though it's making the JFK start time start earlier. Um, my friends couldn't be here tonight because they're too busy. So I am their spokesperson. I'm delivering you their message, and we are begging you to change the start time at any means necessary. <laughs> Please change the start time for the sake of the students. Thank you. OK, the next uh, speaker is Rene Wetstein. Hello, I'm Rene Wetstein. I live at 222 Elm Street. And that's my boy, Zach Dietz. And my oldest son used to sit with you last year. And I have to report he's at UMass. He loves education for truly the first time. He's one of those kids that is dyslexic and does have disabilities. And he doesn't have a class before 10 o'clock. So he's just thrilled. Um, since two, 2007, I have repeatedly come to the school committee. Different members have come and gone. And I have passionately argued that the present high school start time is not educationally, emotionally, or physically in our high school students' best interests. I have even argued it is a life and death issue since our exhausted teens are driving. Maybe they will get injured, or maybe they will injure one of you, or one of your children, or one of your siblings. Um, it's a huge issue. I've witnessed this issue discussed over and over again, and the conclusion is always the same. Yes, we believe the research. Yes, we know that some teenagers may be depressed because of lack of sleep. Yes, we know that the present start time and bus start time of 6.33 a.m. borders on child abuse. But we just don't have the money to fix it. And we don't want younger students sharing buses with high school students. We don't want to flip the elementary school start times with the high school start times because we can't have young children waiting for the bus in the dark. It's too expensive <coughs> and complicated. And then there's the Smith schedule and sports. After four forums, Mr. Salser comes up with a, with a no cost plan that sounds too good to be true, an 8.15 high school start time. The downside, a 15 minute change to the middle school. 
At the forum when it was presented, the attendees all acknowledged that this is an unfortunate consequence, but that the JFK start time would still be later than the present high school start time, and that the net benefit to our teenagers for four years of 45 minutes more sleep is worth it. Is this, is this the best plan and only plan? Well, we don't know, because the school start time advocates have never been allowed to be in the strategy meetings with the superintendent and the transportation supervisor, looking at the bus routes and the times and trying to work out a solution. We've been repeatedly told that is, that is for the administration to work out, so we have to live with this. I never expected the backlash headed by the JFK principal, Ms. Wilson. Truly how naive of me to believe this was going to be easily voted. Is this not, if this is not strongly advocated by the superintendent or approved by the school committee, then I suggest a plan B. We provide Red Bull to all our students when they walk in the high school doors at 7.15 a.m. We scrap lunch, which is not really lunch when it starts at 10.40. The 20 minutes the kids get for lunch right now is totally unnecessary. We hand them a power bar after third period, forget about school help. If they don't understand things in class, well, that's too, too bad. Survival of the fittest. The true focus is now on creating winning sports teams so the students who now have two hours of practice five days a week can skip extra help and get right into practice. Um, we should extend practices, you know, three, four hours. Students um, forget homework. No more homework. The, you know, Nancy Athos will tell you know, teachers they cannot have homework because there's not enough time in the day. Um, students need nine hours of sleep, and so to get to make sure your kids go to bed in time, we give out sleeping pills. Um, obviously, that's crazy. So please, please pick the 815 start time proposal. Our children's health, welfare, and safety is in your hands. Please make the courageous and right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. The next, uh, the next speaker is Daniel Jones. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Jones. Um, I live in Northampton on Harrison Avenue. I have two children in Northampton High School, a daughter who's a senior and a son who's a freshman. Um, it's my first time speaking about this issue. Um, but I've been a fa in favor of a later high school start time ever since my daughter started high school four years ago. And with Superintendent Salter's ideas and leadership and the school committee's resolution to find a workable plan, I'm more hopeful than ever before that it might finally happen. And I'm truly grateful for the plan that you came up with. Um, a lot of us doubted that that would happen, and uh, a lot of people are very grateful um, that a workable plan uh, was arrived at. It will be too late for my daughter, but not for my son and for all the NHS students to come. I just want to make two small points, uh, since so many of the larger points have been made again and again. Um, first, the concern about Smith College courses. The scheduling for this does not work now. My daughter is currently taking a Smith class, and the only way for her to do it, and she tried many ways to arrange for this, I don't think the Smith courses and the Northampton courses were ever set up to be coordinated, and they certainly aren't now. The only way for her to get to her class is to leave, she requested to leave her AP Spanish class 15 minutes early, twice a week, which the teacher was not happy about, but accepted. Um, get rushed to Smith by my wife by car, <laughs> uh, along with another student who's making a different class at the same time. So it is a, a carpool at least, and then rushed back to the school again by car to make her next class at the high school. The current scheduling doesn't work, it wasn't set up to work, and we shouldn't worry about trying to preserve it. Second, I believe the only feasible plan of the three is the one that causes JFK to start 15 minutes earlier. Uh, although I sympathize with those who would have to adapt to this change uh, for three years at most, these students are the same ones that would then benefit with a 45 minute later start time for four years, four years of work and grades that will matter more in terms of college and jobs, four years when some will be driving, and four years when they can get 45 minutes more sleep. I hope uh, JFK students and parents can think of those three years of 15 minutes of, as a down payment on 45 minutes when it really matters. I don't think this will happen any other way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Richard Norris. Thank you, and thank the school committee. Um, I, 
I'm kind of up here in two uh, capacities. First of all, the personal. Um, my son just started Northampton High School after uh, two years at JFK, and well, boy, what a difference. Uh, I've come to many of these meetings, but it wasn't, as Zach Dietz was saying, didn't, it didn't become real until about eight days ago. And uh, he's a kid who needs a little extra time getting up in the morning and getting ready, and he's getting up at around six, where he's, he used to get up about a quarter to seven to get to JFK. And for the first time in his life, he's now taking naps when he comes home from school because he's so tired. And he used to bounce out of bed in the morning. I have a hard time waking him up now, which puts a lot of stress on us. He's just tired. He, he's old, Because he's older, he's almost 15 now, he needs more sleep. And at the same time, he's getting less. I'm estimating he goes into sleep deprivation, accumulates about an hour a day. And you just can't make that up on the weekends. So it is a big deal. Um, my other capacity is as a medical doctor uh, in the community, and I'm particularly concerned. I've been reading all the um, uh, articles in the medical literature that have been given to you on the yellow sheets, and very concerned as an MD about all of our children, since that's my job, um, about the health effects, the depression, the learning effects, and especially the driving. I mean, the driving is really a big deal because if you have car accidents, it's, it, it ruins people's lives. I see it. I'm an I'm a orthopedic uh, spine physician, and I see people who have been in accidents all the time. It changes their lives forever many times. And so we definitely don't want our kids getting in accidents because they're tired. So uh, again, I've been to many of these meetings and I'm really hoping that you adopt the 815 plan. Uh, my son who, who was at JFK w said he would gladly have given up the, you know, the extra 15 minutes of getting to school earlier at JFK as the payback of getting to school 45 minutes later, later at the high school. So please, let's all do the right thing and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Sally Rubenstone. Hi, I'm Sally Rubenstone. I live on Sanderson Avenue in Northampton. Last fall, Northampton High School spent time and money to show the film Race to Nowhere to all students and teachers. Teenage stress is at the epicenter of that movie's message, with parents and professionals asking, what are we doing to our children? Yet, in the wake of that screening, I have seen no change in NHS so far. I've always liked to believe that Northampton is a special town, a smart town. Our average citizens are not average. We are educated. We are aware. So why, then, is Northampton not setting an example when it comes to reducing teenage anxiety? Why is it Northampton being cited in newspapers and magazines as a model for other cities across the country? Northampton once got on NBC Today show for allowing boys on our field hockey teams. So why shouldn't we be on national television for our revolutionary approach to tackling student stress and for creating a culture where our teenagers like to go to school? My own son is an NHS, soph NHS sophomore. <coughs> he is a strong student who takes part in three sports, student government, and other activities. At the end of this past summer, he said to me, if it weren't for having to get up so early and having to do so much homework, I would actually enjoy school. I agree that the hand-in-hand -hand problems of too little sleep and too much homework are creating a generation of students who are unnecessarily unhappy at school and increasingly anxious or even depressed. I think that Northampton needs to be a national leader in reforming both areas concurrently. We should start our high school later and we should cut back on the homework hours our teenagers endure. The aim is not to dumb down our curriculum. As some, home anti, as some homework proponents have suggested, but to allow our teens to spend time pursuing out-of-school educational experiences. My son, for example, wanted to be here tonight, but he's home doing homework. To have a real family life that isn't fraught with to-do list tensions, and to more fully enjoy and profit from their classes. An advanced placement biology teacher who was featured in Race to Nowhere noted that when he, when he reduced the homework load, his student scores on the AP exams actually went up. He explained that being less tired and pressured, they became more fully engaged and in turn better performers. Conversely, one parent, a psychologist, also quoted in Race to Nowhere, pointed out that the minute her daughter finished her AP French exam, the girl announced, good, now I never have to speak French again. Likewise, in my own son, I watched the demise of the joyous learner I remember from Jackson Street School. 
Around him, too, I see students who are exhausted and overworked and who've lost their love of learning. Northampton has the potential to set the standard for the entire country, to put our students on the Today Show again, this time not in hockey kilts, to proclaim that the combination of a little more sleep and a little less homework has made them more enthusiastic and less stressed. Please vote for a later start at NHS and consider making this change part of a two-pronged approach to student sanity by creating homework guidelines, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the end of the list, the sign-up list. Are there other folks who came who didn't sign the list who wish to speak? Okay. If you could just identify your name and your address for the record. I'll make this very quick. I don't have prepared remarks. Um, and I came late because I was helping my exhausted 10th grader. <laughs> get ready for tomorrow. I just wanted to say I've been to a number of the forums. This is you the could just say your name and address for the record. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Jennifer McKenna. I live at 89 Florence Street in Leeds. My son is a 10th grader. Um, and uh, I, I first I wanted to thank the superintendent for developing the 815 plan. Um, I was at a couple of forums and uh, I was so, and then out of the country part of August, I came back and learned that this plan was on the table for the 815 start at no further expense um, to the budget. And I was so grateful and so happy to see that. So I really encourage you to make it happen for 2013. I also want to say quickly, my son, I was so happy to see Suzanne Strauss here tonight and hear what she had to say. My son was in her 7.30 AM writing class last semester. Um, and he suffered because of sleep loss. Um, the second semester of ninth grade, he'd been a student at JFK, a student throughout um, in his first semester of ninth grade, and he was doing B-level work in her class and an English class. And that was in large part due to cumulative exhaustion. He just can't fall asleep before 11.30. We've tried everything. So this will make an enormous difference for him in 11th and 12th grade. So I thank you for him, for me, and for all of the kids who will benefit from this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? OK, then we'll close the public comment period. And we'll move on to the announcements uh, portion of the meeting. Are there any announcements from the school committee? <coughs> I just wanted to quickly acknowledge our um, director of health and safety, Karen Jarvis Vance. Uh, in our newspaper today was this um, um, pamphlet called Parents Guide to Raising Healthy Kids and it's about the Spiffy Coalition and the collaborative work about um, supporting families raising kids in a healthy way and Karen has an article has co-written an article in here and I just want to acknowledge the work that she does on behalf of our district and our neighboring <coughs> districts. Thank you. I have a, a, sort of a notice. Okay. Um, basically it's that uh, parents who advocate for their children who are also on the school committee are um, State law allows us to continue to advocate for our children uh, with just really two um, limits. One is we have to follow exactly the same procedures as every other parent. Um, and the second is we have to uh, file a notice at the city clerk's uh, detailing with whom we have advocated for our children at those completely normal procedures. Um, so in my case, I've been doing that uh, throughout my life here in Northampton, but since I've been on the school committee, I've now filed a uh, uh, notice of the times I have met with school employees to advocate for my students. Are there any other announcements from, uh, from school committee members? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move into the uh, recommended actions and the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda tonight consists of uh, the school committee and alt retreat minutes of August 1st, 2012, the school committee meeting minutes of Thursday, August 9th, 2012. Uh, we then have uh, several contracts that are part of the consent agenda. We have a $15,000 uh, uh, contract for food service software with Tri State Technologies. $78,850 uh, for resurfacing the high school track with Cape Island track, $41,000 for Dectron dehumidifier and hot water with Boulanger Plumbing, 
Uh, that also includes a heater replacement and service. Uh, $13,525 for a replacement of a condensate hot water tank at Leeds. That's with industrial steel boiler. $11,262.30 for custodial supplies, and that's a contract with Kelco Products. $11,554.01 for custodial supplies with Alston Supply Company. $21,555.01 for floor finishing products, again with Alston Supply Company. $15,390 for maintenance, service, and inspections, and that's a contract with Associated Elevator. $3,745 for general maintenance and testing of buildings. This is with FM Generator. $4,871 for sprinkler systems, testing, and inspection, and that's with Simplex Grinnell. $11,710 for IEP software, and that's with ESPED company, uh, $40,000 for produce for food programs, that's a contract with State Street Fruit Store, $100,000 for milk and dairy products, that's a contract with All Star Dairy Foods, and then $10,692.34 for enrichment programs in the schools, and that's a contract with volunteers in Northampton schools or VINs. We also have two field trip requests. One is for uh, R.K. Finn Ryan Road, and that's a trip to Nature's Classroom in Beckett, Massachusetts, November 6th through 9th, 2012. And the Northampton High School, a field trip to Istanbul, Turkey, for a history tour April 9th through the 19th, uh, 2013. <coughs> is there a, a motion to uh, approve the consent? Here, if you want. Yeah, I, I think that it would be, um, it might be prudent to separate the um, Istanbul, Turkey. Okay, that's that a first time questions. request. Okay. okay, so we'll move. Uh, questions on the yeah, contracts as well. Questions. Contracts. Okay, so uh, you would like to take contracts off the consent I, agenda? I just have questions about several of them. Okay, so which ones would you like to take off the consent agenda? It might be prudent just to remove the and ask our questions and then vote them all together after. That would be fine. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take off the field trip and the contracts. So then the remaining items on the consent agenda, if I could have a motion. Move. Move, approve. Okay. Move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Minus the Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded on the consent agenda items minus the ones we've discussed. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so why don't we then move to the contracts? Uh, would you like to ask a question? Okay. Um, uh, move to approve um, contracts as stated. Second. Okay. Um, if I could. First of all, time-wise, I don't know how long ago we did the renovation of the high school, but $78,000 to redo the track, wasn't that new like eight years ago? And it says just replacing the top coat. That's been my memory is that that was on the capital list for a number of years, and that does come from capital improvements. Okay. But I mean, there's those capital improvements funds can be used for something else, too. So I, I realize it's not out of our appropriation budget, but. Ben might remember that better than I do. I remember it as you, as you stated it. Um, and I do remember speaking with Jim Miller in regards to uh, the track, the type of track that we have. And it's an expensive type of track. And All it right. requires maintenance, and this is, uh, I think, uh, even long overdue. So it just is a lot of money. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's getting done. Okay. Second question is regarding the associated elevator and FM generator contracts. Are those <coughs> amounts our portion of a contract that's with the city for maintenance, or are we taking the whole contract and? Back no. charging the city, or we're, we're not responsible for the whole contract. It's divvied up proportionally between the um, Smith folk and the city. So it was beneficial to go out to bid for all of our elevators and all of our uh, maintenance. So, so these are our pieces. This is this dollar amount is our share of the total contract. Correct. 
and um, volunteers in Northampton schools. Love them, but what is this? <laughs> They come in and do provide some services in our school. Um, to See, they're volunteers. They provide volunteers <laughs> in our school. Is this the <coughs> director's yes. salary? And if so, why is it a contract for us? I thought, I, did, I wasn't aware that it was a separate contract. It, it's a contract because we're paying out more than $5,000. And if we're going to pay out in a so she so in other words the director of bands is not a school department employee correct and can you tell me why it's an odd number like this <laughs> i'd have to go to that table over there and go digging through it to give you the odd Fine. number find out why. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't tell all right I guess I've created so enough trouble. <laughs> I believe that's what you pay annually, isn't it, for the VINs coordinator? That's for the whole. That's for the Just entire year. I would have thought it was ten thousand dollars, or ten thousand five hundred, or eleven thousand, or something. I, I, I again, the, the pennies. I don't know. I'd have to go back to the contract. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions regarding the um, set of contracts that need your approval? Okay, hearing none, there's been a motion made and seconded to approve them. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And then uh, I'm sure the finance, uh, your business manager will remind you that you have a table of contracts over there to sign uh, before you leave this evening. So it's a sort of a buffet of contracts <laughs> um, for you to tackle. Um, the next item is uh, the, field, the field trip. Yes, so if you want to recognize the... Uh, Kate Todd Hunter here. Speak. Oh, hi, Kate. There you are. So, thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, as you guys remember, a couple of thank years you. ago, I had the great pleasure of taking 17 NHS students to Germany, to Poland, <laughs> and to the Czech Republic and it changed our lives. It was an incredible trip. And it was so incredible that I decided to do it again, except this time I thought we would go to Turkey. And so what I've put together is an itinerary. I'm going to use the same company that I used for the Eastern European tour two years ago. They were terrific. Um, I thought the price was really reasonable for what it was. Um, there are all sorts of benefits to this company that, um, that will continue with this trip. And I'm hoping that, that you'll approve it. Uh, I've talked to a lot of students. They're very interested in going to, to this part of the world. And I think it, it really will an, be an extraordinary experience. Do we have questions? Do the dates correspond to the April vacation? Yes. Yes. How are you going about selecting students to participate? Uh, well, I have had a lot of students who are interested. And at this point, I think that everyone who wants to go will probably be able to go. But what I told them was it was going to go senior down to freshman. Um, I think I have it in me to do these trips every other year. It's a lot of work. Um, and so what I've told sophomores and, and first year students is that, well, they can go with me in, in two years. So we'll, we're, we'll prioritize it that way. Um, it is very much uh, a history and culture tour. Uh, so in particular, my AP European history students are, are interested, um, just like in the tour that I led two years ago, my history of the Holocaust, AP European history students were particularly interested. But the sense I get from students in the school is, is uh, it's, it's not just students in those classes who'd like to go. 20. Yeah, uh, 17 I brought last time. I think 20 is, is the maximum. It's a private tour. Um, it's a custom tour. So it's just us with a full-time tour director uh, for the duration of the trip. And that, that worked really well last time. It was a great group. How many adults? So there will be, it depends on how many kids sign up. The, the chaperone ratio is six to one. 
Uh, so for every six students, there'll be a chaperone in addition to the full-time tour director um, who will be, my assumption, is a Turkish national, an expert in Turkish history. Uh, why no services at the hammam? Is that a, a budget thing? or? Um, well, <laughs> uh, they're really, really inexpensive actually uh, to, to visit. And the, the way I thought, have you ever been to a hammam? Yeah. They're, they're incredible. Yeah. Um, I thought that not every student would necessarily want to do it. Uh, and so we'll leave that open. Um, if students would like to go to the hammam, I'm definitely going uh, to go to the hammam. Um, they can come. If not, then they can have free time. Yeah. yeah. OK. Any other questions, uh, Ms. Pick? Um, I understand that there's going to be some fundraising, but it's probably not going to bring the price down. So what happened two years ago, and this worked really well, um, there are tips that, that we don't know how much it's going to be in advance, um, those sort of costs. What we did was we fundraised last time, and we covered all those extra costs. And we fundraised enough so that it dropped the price down of the trip for everybody about $100, as well as covering the, the tips. Um, so I think that at minimum, that's what we can do again this time. But I was you know, talking to students. I mean, we can, we can see what else we can do. Um, I'm, I'm open to other options and other possibilities, um, but that that's what we did last time, so that's at the minimum what we'll do this time. I have a, just a general concern. It has nothing to do with this specific trip. Yeah. I think it's really amazing that in our high school we've offered a really broad range of, of global travel. My concern is that most of it doesn't involve much in the way of scholarship, and so those who can afford it really have these amazing opportunities to, to um, take advantage of. And I'm just wondering what it does at all to morale for students who can't even consider something like this. It's an expensive April vacation. It's an incredible one. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's, my concern isn't about this specific. And you know, I, I have a daughter who's been able to take advantage of some of those, and she would love to do this. And and you know, uh, can't do too I much. Hope she of comes. This. <laughs> well, I want her to come. Um, I, I'm really concerned about the number of students who can't take advantage of, or can't, can't even begin to think about doing something like this. And I just wonder how we can think about that in the future, because I, I would hate to see us give up on international study. You know, I'm seeing as I tour my daughter through colleges what a huge emphasis there is now in um, higher, higher ed on global learning. Um, it's just a go to informational sessions, and that's their primary emphasis these days is talking about that. And I think this is great preparation. It really gives the kids an enormous amount of confidence and um, worldliness and um, gets them to be a little bit more out of themselves, a little you know, more um, uh, compassionate and empathetic about what else is going on in the world. But it's not everybody who's getting that opportunity to, to have mm -hmm. that. And I just think that's worth a discussion in the future in some way. Thank you for the time and effort that you put into these trips. You're welcome. My Thank pleasure. you. It's great fun. Thank you. <laughs> so um, when, did you, um, dis when did you announce this trip, decide this trip? Last spring. Last spring. So right. kids did have over the summer. Correct. To at least do some fundraising for it. And how much fundraising do you have to date? Do you have very much? This one? <coughs> I, I got to wait for you guys to say yes before uh, I start raising really so, money. So nobody did anything <laughs> over the summer. It was just a answer. thought. <laughs> OK. <laughs> We didn't actually move approval of this. Item. No, so if someone so would make. I'm going to move approval of the trip as presented. I'll second that. Okay. Any other further questions or discussions? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The. Um, <laughs> We'll now move, continue into the rest of the agenda, uh, reports and recommendations, and the uh, first among those is the business manager's report. Thank you. Um, just a couple noteworthy items. Um, the FY13 budget is and expected to be loaded up into the Muni system in October, so right at the moment you, you do not have a financial statement for the FY13 
uh, activity that's happened over the summer. You, the financial statement you do have is the FY12 data, the final statement as we ended the year. Um, as a reminder, our FY13 budget is up on the school website, and you can look at that. It's the same budget you received booklets on back on June 14th. And right now, as you know, um, the Department of Ed is uh, formulating and getting all of their information by all business managers across the state. So we are knee deep into filing our end of the year report, which gives us you know, six, seven million dollars of, of Chapter 70 funding that comes from the state for us. You do have a smorgasbord of, of contracts this evening. I think this is the most amount of contracts when I went back and looked that you've ever received in any one meeting. Um, I don't know how they all culminated and came together all at one time, but they did. Um, nine of the 14 contracts have, are being paid out of maintenance, which is our 4,000 account series, or capital accounts that are previously approved monies and capital funds. Uh, let's see, on the second page, um, the Clark School of Construction has been completed um, up at the Leeds School. Uh, the final nursing medical um, distribution agreement has been signed and approved by both the school department uh, and the Leeds Street School. Um, that agreement is set forth and it allows us to administer medications and provide medical services to those students while they are here in our buildings. <clears throat> we needed to have something formally in writing for that just to make sure our nursing staff was covered and um, we were covered and we, we uh, needed that in place before uh, the first day of school. Uh, food service, uh, the software notification module uh, to purchase uh, food lunches has been installed. The software was available starting on Monday the 10th. So again, parents can track outstanding balances of students, make payments online, view what their child is eating, and this will help eliminate uh, any uh, paper documentation that goes home to the students, that gets lost in their backpacks, that gets missing, and all the late notices and all the other kind of things. I think this is going to work out really well. Um, it's a step in the right direction overall. Um, many schools are doing this, so uh, um, this is going to work out really well. Can you ask uh, a question about that? Sure. Is there, um, is there still the ability to have paper notices sent to those who don't have access to a computer? I realize that's odd these days, <laughs> but there may be some families who don't have access to electronic. Mm -hmm. We can do that, but we just need to know who they are. Okay, but I mean, if they were to contact you and say, I don't have regular access to a computer, can you send me something to my home? That I'm, I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can. In my sense is if you pay by a check, if you continue to pay just normally, like Correct. then you probably would still get the normal. It's only if you're logged into the system. Well, you can, you can go online and see your balance at any time, whether yeah. you pay with a check or you pay okay. with a card, you'll still be able to see your balance. It just gives you a different avenue in which to make the payment. Uh, both Carol and Barbara from Food Service um, are attending and will be attending all the school open houses to meet with the parents uh, to demonstrate the software, uh, accept any payment for lunches, uh, so they can also educate the parents on that night and educate some of the staff that might want to be uh, informed as to how the process works. I would, I would just, if I could interrupt really quickly, I would also hope that during those times that um, perhaps Barbara and Carol could be available to talk about some of the new standards and regulations in the food service this year with a lot of the changes that have come down from the, the government. And I'd also like to just put a pitch in it. Maybe we can make a note that I think um, with our last budget, we, we voted more money to go into food service. Well, we finally put some money into food service and I'm already starting to be concerned with that amount because of the food that is being served and the fact that a lot of the food now is going onto the tray and therefore more food is going out to students. Whereas before they had a choice, 
and so the food may never, never have reached the tray and now it's going onto the tray and it's being discarded that I, I have a sense that more food is actually being used and because it's more healthy that it may be costing more. So I wonder if, you know, we do hear from Carol once a year, it might be nice either to have her come to uh, budget and property or to report halfway through the season just to see if we're on target. For one of the upcoming meetings, and I know Carol and I had already talked about this, is the new regulations that are out there in next month or the following month to come and at least talk to the committee, give you some information on that. I believe some of the information right now is up on the website. If you browse through and you click on menus, click on uh, food service, you can get to some of the new regulations. But sometimes it's also nice just to hear somebody explain it to you so you can really hear it other than just reading the narrative that's there. And there are still continuous, continuing changes that will happen even next year. So, um, you know, we're in that three-year cycle of changes in the food service depart, uh, food service um, venue of, of where we're going, how we're serving food, the type of foods we're serving, the extra uh, portions of uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, I think you probably need to hear it firsthand, and I think that will help you understand what is coming down for regulations and what, we're, what we have to comply with. I just had another question mark. Is it, when it says it'll view what their child is eating, how detailed does that get? You know? <clears throat> I don't, and I can only say honestly, only because it's just gone up on the 10th, I haven't had the chance to go through and browse that myself in the last four days. So I don't know at what level, but now that we probably have uh, a number of students that are already in the system that way. Um, I can look I can look and report back to you next month and, and let you look know. on my own account. That's okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will you let me know because I don't have a student. I wanted to follow up on, on what Ed was saying. Um, a couple of years back I was at Ryan Road School and they were giving apples automatically on every single tray and I had remarked to how many apples were ending up immediately into the trash. And now, I'm not sure what they're going to do now that we have to do this, whether we have to put that apple back on their tray. But the kids are allowed to take the apple or not take the apple, which results in a lot less apples in the trash. So um, I'm just interested to know, do we have to go back to take, putting the apple on as counting it as one of the two, or did we still, there were a lot of apples in that trash. That's walking the fine line of whether you leave the choice up to the student to pick the apple or you actually serve the apple to the students. So you right, do we have to serve it to them again with the new guidelines or can they yeah, still pick it again? Yeah. I think yeah, next month we should have well, Carol explain so it. My understanding is that we have to serve the complete meal in order to get the federal reimbursement for it. So we you need to ask them how many apples got yeah. thrown away. I mean, because it no, was a we lot had this, of apples. Um, my understanding from Mr. Kanata, we had a same issue with beets this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's a surprise, but the beets I mean, had to be on the tray. Not right. touched. You make borscht or something. I do understand. <laughs> And at the time, we couldn't even Life give up the horses. I mean, when I asked about, I mean, we're wasting a whole, because the trash right. can was filled right. with apples, and I said, we're wasting all this, and can't we talk to Mrs. Riddle? Can't we give them to, you know, I understand the guidelines, but horses, farmers, somebody, because they were just all getting thrown away. I do understand. It seems like a waste. It is a waste. It is a waste. It is a waste. Yeah. It's a change of approach, a change of eating habits, a change of culture of how we change their habits of what they eat and there's certain portions now where they have to have dark green vegetables versus just green vegetables so there are some very fine lines and I can have Carol explain that to you and you have to serve the dark greens twice and there's some and, and these are rules and regulations that have come down to us and we're just trying to fit them in on the tray right okay right right and my last piece is uh, I just want to make note because most of you, if you've been out to the buildings during the summer, we've hired summer uh, students to do summer <coughs> painting. And these students were just about in every building in the district. And what I did here in my report was to list the buildings out in the sum, not all of the locations by which they were in in painting. So if you saw 
doors painted and walls and office space and hallways and cafeteria, ceilings, uh, exterior, inter interior doors, uh, stairwells. Um, these summertime painters that worked for us, um, I think, did a phenomenal job. Okay. Uh, would you like to transition right into the personnel report? Sorry, just a quick question. Sure. Um, so I'm just, I don't know how other people feel about this, but in the past, um, with contractors, we just send them around during the meeting so that at the end of the meeting we're not all sitting around, especially if it's a late meeting, trying to sign it, especially if some people jet out early and a few of us are there. Um, but looking at that table of contracts, I don't know if people will be signing that. I think we actually decided not to do that because we were so distracted by signing contracts that we weren't listening to content, mm -hmm. and we're not going to be leaving right after the meeting. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I'm thinking like Martin Clark. Like, <laughs> when we get out, we're going to be signing a lot of contracts. Right. <laughs> but thanks. It's one of it's one of those first of the year openings. Yeah. You got a phenomenal yeah. amount of contracts, and also if you look at the personnel report, uh, starting the year off, there, it's a two-page report this time. Um, obviously, the first page is all the new hires that we have brought into the school district. The second page covers the separations, the retirements, and any internal promotions or transfers of existing staff. This is a lot of movement of our staff to start the year off, to have this much. This is, this is a lot. Okay. Any questions about the personnel report? Okay. We'll move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you. I'd like to start the night uh, by introducing my superintendent coach, Kevin Courtney, is in the back. Kevin is uh, the coach assigned to me through the Mass Association of School Superintendents. He was with me all last year. You heard me talk about him, and tonight he's here to watch us work. And uh, as the assignments go, he is with me for a total of three years, so we have two more years together. Thank you for being here tonight. A couple of things I wanted to make you aware of, uh, Clark School. I've been out there uh, more than a couple of times to start the school year. It seems to be going very well. And they have requested they could put up a sign, a Clark School sign. Um, I believe that there is no school committee approval needed. We worked through buildings and grounds. I'm working with Dave Pomerantz on what we need to do to get approval for a sign. They would like to put a sign that's smaller than the lead school sign and put it maybe underneath ours or off to the side of ours, just so their families have some indication that it's the Clark School too, not just leaves. I wanted to give you a school choice update. I have some specific numbers, and Jennifer Towler was here earlier, but I, I believe she's, oh, there you are. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, you remember me complimenting Jennifer's work in the spring. Uh, one of the things that I heard in my, through my entry plan was that we needed to improve our communication with parents through the school choice process and also expedite the decision making so parents know their kids are going to be in our schools or not. And Jennifer and our central office team have done an excellent job with that. And I want to uh, just give you a report of the results tonight very quickly. Uh, last year we filled 38 seats through school choice, and this year we filled 68 seats. That's an, an increase. 30. Simple math. What this means, overall right now in school choice, we have 226 kids sitting in our classrooms. <coughs> And as you know with school choice, what we are doing is maximizing the seats in our classrooms. So these kids are supposed to fill out classrooms um, that have space. So we're not actually hiring additional staff to do this. This 226 <coughs> kids in our school this year is up uh, 40 from last year. Just a round figure, uh, school choice is bringing us $1.1 million in general tuition. And that's not including the special education enhancers, because some students with disabilities come with additional funds from their sending districts. And I, I wanted you to have those numbers tonight to see what a great job Jennifer has been doing and uh, this wonderful improvement for our schools. Next, I wanted just to make you aware of a <coughs> major change for families and for our, school, our high school students especially. Now, we are concerned about the eastern equine encephalitis virus, and we do know that somebody contracted this uh, disease in our area. And so tonight is our last uh, night game uh, until the first frost, until this is safely over with. So starting tomorrow, our games at night will be moved to the day. So Friday night football will be played Saturday afternoon. And this is in coordination and cooperation with other <coughs> districts uh, that are looking to make the same move. Uh, 
It's just exercising caution. So I wanted you to be aware of that. The highlights tonight. I asked the principals and teachers to give me some highlights of what the first day of school was like. What was it like for our kids that first moment? And I want to share some of those with you tonight. At NHS, Sue Crago in AP Junior English reports that she jumped right into the basics of rhetorical analysis. Students were given the text of two speeches, Ronald Reagan's speech on the Challenger disaster and George W. Bush's speech on the Columbia disaster. She chose them because they share the same speaker, the president, the same subject, the loss of astronauts, the same primary audience, the general American public. Without giving students the background, she had them read both speeches and then identify the one they thought was more effective, giving reasons why and examples of what worked and what didn't work. As a class, they jumped in, excited to do this, and began engaging in rhetorical analysis before they even knew what rhetorical analysis was. Uh, afterwards, they discussed the rhetorical triangle and what makes effective writing, and this is how she introduced the kids to AP language and composition. John Sass in uh, statistics started off with an exercise where he took uh, groups of students in, in groups of three and they got a bag with 100 pieces of data. They didn't know that each bag contains exactly the same information. Each bag included 100 annual incomes of people, mostly 20,000 to 60,000 range, but several very large incomes including one $12 million annual income. Each group pulled out a sample of 20 incomes and they calculated the statistical inferences that they gathered from their sample size. The point at the end of course is that depending on the sample they picked they got very different answers even though they all had the exact same data in their bag. A clever way to start the year. JFK uh, is beginning the year with a school-wide read. On Monday morning, September 10th, everyone at JFK started the book The Misfits by James Howe. The Misfits was published to critical acclaim and has been widely read in middle schools across the country. The story focuses on a group of five seventh graders who are determined to end name calling in their school. To be seen not as misfits, but as the unique individuals that they are. So the reading of the novel began uh, during JFK Forum. The first chapter is read aloud to the entire school. Activities related to the novel's themes of name calling, personal differences, and tolerance for others will take place in forum, groups, and English language arts classes. The all school reads intended to build community and share the joy of reading. Over at Bridge Street School, Miss Galinsky's second grade read First Day Jitters to the students and they had a discussion about each of the students' own First Day Jitters. Then they created All About Me posters and quilt squares as students had to draw labels about themselves. I have to do an aside here. I met with some second graders today and this All About Me is really appropriate. The teacher asked me, I was walking by the hallway, and he asked me to come in and sit down. He said, students, the superintendent is here. He'll give you some time. You can ask him any question you want to ask him. And the students were so excited, you know, I could hear them. And their hands were in the air, and he started to call on students. They said, my mom's in the Navy. My mom works at a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and they went on and on telling me all about themselves. <laughs> Didn't ask one question. <laughs> Love second graders. <laughs> Over at Jackson Street School. The first day of school, the fifth graders at Jackson Street, um, the teachers and students did a friendship building activity called Sign the Wall. Each student had a sheet with bricks, and those had various attributes, talents, or descriptions, which they took around to their classmates, asking if they fit the description. Some examples would be, I can write my name backwards, I read at least four books this summer, I know how to use chopsticks. There were 27 bricks in all, and the students got to know each other and interact on the first day of school. Over at Ryan Road, Mr. Kerstetler's uh, fifth grade students mixed it up by purposefully sitting with different classmates at lunch. Each small lunch group had a facilitator who had conversation starters and prompts to get the classmates talking and making new friends. And over at Leeds School, the kindergarten and first grades were practicing in the first six weeks the basic tenets of responsive classroom. So it was a wonderful opening in our schools. I also wanted to share with you tonight uh, some of our grants. I know that occasionally we give you the grants report in the business <coughs> manager's report, and I believe yes, you have these in front of you. So no need for me to read those to you, just a couple of highlights. 
Uh, Karen Jarvis Vance, Barbara Black, as you can see, are the two who have written all these recent grants. And they do a tremendous job, not only in the work that they do with our children every day, but these two people are constantly writing grants and advocating for more money for special programs for our schools. And uh, Karen Jarvis Vance just landed the Sober Truth on Preventing Underage Drinking, the STOP Act, for 193000 in addition to a four-year grant of $625,000. Barbara Black is working on, you're all familiar with the Race to the Top grant, but this is Race to the Top for Early Learning Challenge Partnerships, and this is up to $200,000. She recently submitted it. It looks good, and we'll report back to you if we get that money. The rest of the grants I would celebrate as well. In the interest of time, I will move on. That. Oh, I'm sorry. Also in the superintendent's report, <coughs> now the uh, private charter school approvals will come later. Sorry about that. I'm done with the superintendent's report. Okay. Okay, the next item is we have a required vote uh, to ratify the 2011-2013 collective bargaining agreements for the following bargaining units, uh, teachers, administrators, educational support professionals, clerical, cafeteria, and custodian. And I would ask the vice chair if she would make a motion. I will make that motion. Do you want me to repeat it? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I move that we ratify the 2011 to 2013 collective bargaining agreement for the following bargaining units, teachers, administrators, educational support professionals, clerical, cafeteria, and custodians. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there a discussion or any? Okay, hearing none. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Okay. So uh, it's uh, approved with one abstention. Okay. Uh, <coughs> next, we have uh, a report from the superintendent on school start. <coughs> the moment we've all been waiting for. <coughs> uh, you have the copy of the proposals uh, in your packet tonight. And I would like to start with a five-minute introduction to this discussion. I want to share with you the, how much I appreciate the opportunity I had to learn about the history of this ongoing issue, but I also appreciate the time you gave for me to adequately study, review, and create these proposals that I brought to you tonight. It appears that this issue has been on the table for anywhere between six to nine years. The answer varies on, on who you ask. It's hard to determine exactly when it began. It is agreed, though, that it began around the issue of adolescent sleep patterns and sleep needs. And it's important to note that nearly everyone involved in this issue agrees with the research. The debate, the decision, has never been about that. The question is about what level of priority is this item and how to go about making a systemic change that affects so many people's lives. It's obvious that the current system is not 100% satisfying to families. And through months of research, I will assure you it's clear there will not be an alternative that is 100% satisfying either. The prevailing issue is that we need to make a decision on this one way or another. And that's what I'm hoping we will do when we vote in October. As you know, I was assigned the task to bring a proposal to school committee that schedules the high school to start no earlier than 8 a.m. and that if this is implemented, it would start next September. In order to build this proposal, I reached out to the community through a series of four public forums. And after the second, I wanted more input. I wanted more widespread input. And so I sent out a survey. And we received 2,200 responses from that survey. Throughout the process in the past several months, my ideas, my proposals evolved due to the responses I received. I did discover the following five points. First, no one is interested in pushing this change if it will cost additional dollars. Given our strapped financial status, we only are interested in a no-cost option. Second, our three-tiered bus system remains the most cost-efficient way to transport our students. After looking at some creative alternatives, we return to the three-tier system. Third, we learned how to more efficiently book and overbook our buses to maximize capacity and re <coughs> reduce costs, which helps our system regardless of the change. Fourth, we could and should negotiate an additional 20 minutes to our elementary school day regardless of the change. 
This will improve student learning time and will create a more efficient transportation system. I have had the chance to talk with Sharon Carlson about this, and we have some ideas, of course. It's all subject to collective bargaining, but uh, we, we have started the discussion. And the fifth point is I would like you, as a school committee and as the general public, to please keep in mind there will be an increase in our transportation costs next year, no matter what. Our current bus contract is very favorable to us, and it ends at the end of this year. It will be negotiated over the next several months, and we are predicting an <coughs> increase in the neighborhood of about $240,000 per year. When this happens, I wouldn't want anyone to misconstru misconstrue that that cost increase had anything to do with this decision. In our final forum, our shortest one by far, the three, proposal, three proposals in front of you were well received. The Late Start supporters embraced number three, as you heard tonight. Number two received little attention or support. And number one, which stays with the current time, yet asks for an increase <coughs> in the ele elementary day by 20 minutes, uh, was on it as well. I know many would like to hear my recommendation. Understandably, I'm hesitant <laughs> to make one. <laughs> my task was to bring proposals developed with community input and vetted through my central office team. And I bring these <coughs> tonight for our school committee to discuss and to eventually make a decision. I encourage you to make a decision based on what you feel the community value is, what you feel the voice of the community is telling you, and combine that with your own informed opinion on what's best for our children. And with that decision, our team will carry it out. You've been researching this for years. You have heard from many, many stakeholders. The past roadblocks, the athletic teams, and Smith College courses, they're not roadblocks. They can be accommodated. It's important for me to represent our administrative <coughs> team and our teachers' voices. Our administrative team is unanimous. They do not support the change. Our teachers are split, yet the simple majority do not support a change. All in all, we are willing to carry out the decision of the school committee. We will do so in good faith and with our usually, usual high quality work. But all I ask is that this decision is final <coughs> for a period of five years. The decision has been years in the making. And now our energy should turn to carrying out the work of improving student learning and student performance through effective instruction and curriculum. And with that, I open up this agenda item for discussion. Okay. Do folks have uh, questions for the superintendent? Mr. Meyer. Okay. I understand that the extension of the elementary school day is positive for reasons that are completely unrelated to high school start time, but at the same time, when you present it as no additional cost, you would not have to make that change or you might, we might not undertake that change were it not for this opportunity or this impetus. So I'm wondering, in your discussions, both with the administrative leadership team and with the head of the Northampton Association, gotten a sense of how much that will cost the district to obtain those additional services from staff? I haven't costed it out yet. Um, and again, that was an idea that came through the evolution of preparing these proposals. I heard over and over again how it would be better for the busing system. Elementary kids wouldn't have to wait in the hallway at the end of the day. It would be more efficient. And with those extra 20 minutes, we can do some pretty valuable things with the kids, potentially increasing the amount of time that the specialist teachers work with the kids, which would increase the prep time that teachers have. Um, there could be a win-win with that, but I do not know the cost of it. Yeah. Other questions? Mr. Moore. Yeah, I had a question as to why um, three tiers is more cost effective than two. <coughs> we went through this many, many times. We weren't able to create a two tier system that was effective. Why not? I don't know why not. We weren't able to do it. Because, and I'll tell you why I'm, I'm, I'm asking this, because. Um, Two years ago, we couldn't do two tiers with yellow buses. Um, this spring, with similar numbers, we were able to. Um, but 
we wouldn't be able to, all of a sudden, it was appeared that we couldn't do it with the um, van pool vans. Except that the numbers of seats in the van pool vans at the elementary level that would be available to high school students is greater than the number of high school students who ride van pool vans, which makes it seem to me that we could combine the elementary and high school routes in both the yellow buses, which after two years of working, turns out there is room. It seems to me we could do the same thing with the van pool vans, that there is room, actually. I mean, you know, these, the, the seats in the vans don't, they, there are how many there are. And the students, the numbers are what they are, and there is excess capacity even after you put all of the high school kids on the vans with all of the elementary kids, which wouldn't necessarily be necessary because if you were running to the elementary schools first, then you could pick up some, some high school kids between the elementaries and the high school. So I guess I don't understand. I'd like to hear why it's not possible when the numbers make it possible. I'd like to hear what the additional reason is that I'm not familiar with. Uh, Can I hear that now? I don't have an answer for you, Mr. Moore. I just told you. Okay, because that our bothers me that I don't have an answer now, now because I alerted you to this issue in July. We did look at your proposal in July. And you found we out it wasn't fine, possible, but we don't know possible. why it's not possible. I wasn't prepared to answer that question tonight. Okay. Just when will I have an answer? I don't think you can answer that right now. But here's what I want to say about that. For the first thing I'd like to say is I really want to thank the superintendent. He, this was not his issue. This is not how he wanted to focus on his first year. We charged him with a task and he has met the challenge of what we asked him to do in, you know, in his first year where he's learned so much about the district. And I think that he's really done a very commendable job. No disrespect, but I think it's really unfair at this meeting to come with questions about proposals that aren't being presented. We've had lots of forums. I think we've had lots of time to ask questions. We've all known that this is, the, these are, this is what's being presented tonight. And I think that this is what's appropriate for us to be discussing tonight. Um, That's what I'm asking. He said three tiers is the most cost effective. Yes, and our I'm understanding from years, our understanding two. from our years of research is that it's more cost effective because if we do two tiers, we have to transport more students in the same period of time, which would therefore have more buses. And that costs more than having a smaller number of buses run three routes. And that's what we've been told for years. But, it's but not I don't true. think that this mm -hmm. is the time to be discussing mm -hmm. alternative plans. We asked him to bring a plan to us, and that's what he's done. Well, I think Howard has a good point, though. I mean, if it's a way to save money and it's his concern, I mean, it, I understand what you're saying, too, Stephanie, but, I mean, it is interesting if, if I mean, what is it? Is it because the two tier <coughs> system doesn't work because ultimately we don't want our kids, our elementary and our, and our high school together? I mean, is it a, an issue of principle? I mean, I mean, I can understand his wanting to know if we could save money elsewhere, otherwise. That's all. But if you don't know, you don't know. I'm not going right. to. I do know that we analyzed it in the summer. We returned to the idea that the most efficient and effective way to transport the students was the three-tier bus system. I don't have a detailed answer for you tonight. But we could, we could provide that. We can certainly do that. OK. Just can't do it tonight. Exactly. Yeah. Mr. Bourne. Just going to say, I mean, the, the school committee has come under some criticism for <coughs> taking so long to figure this out. I think <coughs> I agree with Stephanie. I would say look at the proposal that are on the table and let's move forward. I mean, I don't think this is the time to, to delve back into two tier versus three tier. Well, except, except that if you do, just for the van pool alone, <coughs> it's one ESP to go from three tiers to two tiers. It's one ESP, $20,000. You know, we've spent how much time agonizing over single ESPs in the budget process? I think it's appropriate to do it now as opposed to next spring when we have another budget in front of us and we're trying to find 20000 Say two hundred thousand. I just want to go back to something that the oh. superintendent said. Um, I have been a um, an advocate for start time, uh, for a change in the high school start time, and I'm actually very pleased with the proposal that's the third proposal that's been made. I am disheartened to hear that there is unanimous lack of support among our administrators, and I'm wondering without 
you know, divulging anything personal, if you can speak to that at all. And, and so I preface it by saying, I know that, um, that there's a lot of belief that we run a very good district, and why would we change something that works so well? And we also have heard you and everybody else say that the, the research is not disputable. Um, and, and I agree with that. But I'm wanting to know why this feels, um, I mean, it shouldn't be coming as a surprise to the administrators. And I'm wondering <coughs> what their reluctance is about and if you could speak to that in a general way at all. All right. We um, have talked about it all along. Uh, but. I asked them for an official stand this summer during our summer retreat so that I could represent them to the school committee. And I would say the basic feeling is that if we could, you know, the proposal number two, which moves everybody forward a half an hour, uh, that is something that could, is probably the most palatable to the administrators. But to move the high school into <coughs> later and make JFK earlier, they don't want to have that sense of rivalry. That w so the middle school teachers are saying, now we have to do this because of you. It, we work very hard to have a cohesive team and a collaborative team. And they don't want to have one move forward and the other move back so just to feel good to our team. Have you, as a group, talked about, if we vote this change, um, how to help make it more palatable for staff and to, I mean, to help them accept a change like that because you know as what was said um, we're talking about moving the middle school 15 minutes earlier but it's still later than what our high school does now and as a parent of two teens my experience is that in sixth and seventh grade the early start time really wasn't an issue it's somewhere around the hormones start to change somewhere around that eighth grade with the girls it's the hair and the makeup that takes so long in the morning and um, um, so um, and I'm, I guess I, I'm not understanding in a big way that the 15 minutes would seem like such an enormous change at the middle school, mm -hmm. but, um, um, and we've certainly heard from high school teachers who are in favor, so I'm just wondering <coughs> the, the mix there, if we have um, um, percentages that are recent from the start of this year of where high school teachers are and middle school teachers are and um, you know I, I know that we have a great staff and they're going to accept the decision we make eventually and move on and hopefully not let it um, get in the way of their doing what they do so well um, I would hope that we're not going to lose anybody over you know, this kind of a change um, but I'm just wondering if you can add anything to that again uh, I think one of the most important points that I made in my introduction is that we, uh, we, we will implement whatever plan you ask us to do, and we will do it uh, in good faith, high quality work. Uh, these three proposals are proposals we can live with. We can live with them. But it's important for me to share with you what the administrators felt was their number one proposal. And their number one is proposal one. Proposal, proposal one. Yeah. Proposal one. Or proposal two. Proposal one. Uh, I just had a question. If in, in your discussions with the administrative team, was there any talk about how we're going to, if at all, assess what, how are we going to know if we're spending all this time to make a change, how are we going to know that it's good for us? Uh, we've had a lot of, um, uh, a lot of promises that it's going to do everything from reduce anxiety to eliminate naps among adolescents. And I just um, think it, there's some value in and uh, we measure absences in the first period or visits to the nurse or things like that just so that we can say, yeah, this is something that has worked for us. Or, I mean, not that I think it would go this way, but just in case it does. Wow, there's something really off here because something isn't right. And I don't know if you had those discussions. Well, I've thought a lot about that, how we're going to measure if it works. Uh, right now, our high school is on such a trajectory of improved performance uh, every year that uh, you know, I, I, I would be amazed if we could make substantial improvement by making this change because they're having so much success right now. Uh, I know that some of the research cites um, <coughs> deprivation and depression, and we don't have data on that. 
We don't have data that shows that our students are any more or less depressed than a school who starts at 8.15. We don't have baseline data, so I can't say that there's anything we can measure about its impact on our students' lives. You can measure attendance. You can measure attendance, of course. And breakfasts or mm -hmm. visits to the nurse or something like that. Mr. Meyer? So I just had a question about feasibility. I know that the current, I'm going to call it the reset time between, or the gap between the different levels is inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, currently, uh, my sons are getting home at around 355, mm -hmm. which means, and the reason they're getting home at 355 is not that the elementary school roots are any longer, is that they are standing outside of the elementary school. So I'm just, and the current gap between the elementary and the middle school roots, if I'm looking at it correctly, is half an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. So knowing that that's inadequate, and I know from talking to the bus driver that adjustments are coming, and they always do at the beginning of the year, your proposal three is also going to have that gap between JFK and the high school is 30 minutes. It's projected at 2.15 and 2.45 dismissals. And so if it's not working now, I'm wondering how is it going to work in the future with, with the adjusted start time? That's a good question. That's the first run? Right. And the second run from the high school to the elementary is an increase in the amount of time. You see that one is 40 minutes. True. So the buses have more time to get to the elementary so the kids aren't waiting, standing there outside. But the issue is not the high school runs. The high school runs are the short ones. It's the middle school that has the highest ridership. So even if you, you know, you're going to have a backup, I mean, you're saying that that 10 extra minutes. It helps. It, 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 ha it may help, but right. you're still going to have the buses arriving late to the high school, right? They don't, 30 minutes is not enough to complete late the routes the right now. Oh, you're talking so late the afternoon to the, or morning? I'm talking afternoon. Mm -hmm. Right, at 2.15, mm -hmm. they start their routes for JFK. We already know that that half an hour is not enough for them to complete their routes and get back to a school to pick up because it's not happening right now. Right. So I agree with you that that 10 extra minutes, they may make up some of that time. Right. But I'm just, I'm just concerned that we don't want to create a system that's not going right. to work. It's not perfect. We have data, if we have data right now that it's not working. So right. we, we, we cut from 11 to 9 to save money, right. but we're seeing the consequences of it. So. Right. And I'll go back to uh, one of my opening statements is that our current system is not 100% perfect. Right. And our, alter our alternatives will also not be 100% perfect. I just want to answer to that. At the last forum, I was sitting next to Joy and asking her questions, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting what I understood. But um, I think what I heard her say is that because the high school needs fewer buses, that the shorter, the, the, um, the middle school buses with the shorter routes would be the ones to go to the high school, and the ones that are going the furthest out would not have to go to the high school, would do their longer route and go to the elementary school. So I think that she, I think what I heard her tell me is that she did not expect that to be as much of an issue with this plan because there are many, many fewer buses that we use at the high school. Does that make sense? No. It sh because it should, it should be right now that the high school buses that have shorter routes, they're already running be before the middle school. So they should, they should already be able to reset in the current system no, as well. Why. It's because, <laughs> it's because, because right now, all of the high school buses go out, but they all have to come to JFK. So right now at JFK, there's always a bus that's half an hour late because it's the longest high school bus. Right. Because JFK uses all of the buses. Okay. If you turn that over, JFK uses all of the buses, but not all of them have to go to the high school. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, okay. so now the longest short, route or not. not. All right. That would be the, at the elementary area. Thank you. How Thank you, Howard. That's it. Mr. Brooks. Uh, we've heard a lot about the um, kind of secondhand of what the impact would be on JFK. I mean, we've got Nancy and Leslie here. Would they be in a position to just talk to us for a couple <coughs> minutes and give us their take on the, th the third plan? Or is that not something they, I mean, I don't want to put them on the spot if they don't want to do it, but <laughs> I, mean, I kind of want to know what they. They're kind of in a unique position to... Right. I do try to protect them from being put yeah, I mean, in spots right. that it's I not, want. It's not something I want yeah. to understand, but it seems like they have some useful information for us and what the impact would be for both of them if they see it. I mean, do you care to speak to the issue or would you prefer not to? I leave it up to you. If you feel... Okay. 
sort of knew this might happen, so I, I came it prepared. Um, I first want to say that you have to know that I support a late start, given the fact that I've worked on it for four years. Long before Brian came, we were having forums and telephone calls and surveys, and in the surveys that Maureen Collins did a few years ago, it was pretty much the same survey as my staff this year. 60% wanted to remain the same, and 40 wanted to try a late start time. I also have to tell you that when I was hired here five years ago, one of my charges was to bring cohesiveness to the elementary, middle, and high school. And I've worked very, very hard to do that. And we have a great relationship. We have a great administrative team. And if I, I feel that, I think it's so important what the research says, but I also feel that it's very important to remember that we are a district and that I feel middle school kids are as well, teenagers, and that they have hormone issues and they wear makeup and they do all the things that high school kids do. And so I, I can't say, I can't recommend it based on what I just told you. And I, I support it. I wouldn't mind having it happen at the high school, but I remain firm that we are a district and we have worked very, very hard to build our relationships together. So I do care about my colleagues, but I care about kids as well. Any questions? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to uh, add something about the buses. We have kids standing here for 15, 20 minutes every day after school waiting for the high school buses. So it's not a JFK issue. It, it starts at the high school. And it's something that's unavoidable, and we all try to be as flexible as we can about that. As far as the late start goes, um, I could just say that I, I would echo what Nancy said. The administrative team really does support, we understand the research and we do support the late start at the high school if it didn't impact the other levels. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, as Nancy said, we've really worked hard to support each other. And we do understand that even for the middle school kids, and I have to speak on behalf of the middle school kids too, our first and second period classes here are very different than our third and fourth period classes. There's no question. You know, um, sleep is something that our students need as well. So to push our students back, the survey that was done, um, overwhelmingly the parents and the students and the faculty at JFK supported no change in the time. That was the survey results. And so, that we've been speaking about. So I, I just wanted to add what Nancy said. I think the administrative team supports uh, the late start if, in fact, it didn't have an impact on everybody else. And I'd like to speak on behalf of JFK and the survey results and our students who actually are pre-adolescents who have sleep needs too. So. Do you um, happen to know with, the new, with this proposal three, what is the earliest that any middle school student would be getting on a bus? Do you happen to know that? I don't, I don't know that. So pretty typically right now our first bus shows up at 7.20. Um, I'm imagining. Right now the earliest is 7.20? Yeah, between 7.20 and 7.30. Now our home would start at 7.45, which means we would need kids in the building here at at least 7.15 in order for them to have breakfast. And do you know what the, how long the longest bus route takes now? So can we figure it out? Or? I really, I, yeah. I, I don't have that. Well, I, do kids, I bring my kids to the bus stop at 7 in the morning. So just the quick math would be we'd be there at 6.45. I'm imagining there'll be kids standing at the bus stop at 6.30 now. Not now, currently, but right, with the change. Down. With the change. So. Thank you. Yep. Can I ask one question? Um, I just want to play devil's advocate for a second because I'm sure this question will come up. I mean, to the average person, 15 minutes doesn't sound like that big a deal. So what's the... I mean, I understand there's a kind of an issue with kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, but what can you say to somebody who might sound, say, like, well, 15 minutes doesn't sound like that big a deal. Why can't they just, you know what I mean? Well, I think in the big scheme of things, as far as our kids, you know, having time in the morning and, and getting the extra sleep, I think 15 minutes is, is a lot. When, when we started this conversation years ago about high school start time, you know, 15 minutes was something that we were talking about right. as being you know, having an impact on kids in either direction. Um, so, and it, it yeah, I'll, I guess I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, how well informed do you think the JFK parents are about? What's happening? Yeah. Um, well, I did send a, um, some information out 
and it wasn't a backlash, it was informational, um, and, and that's what was said earlier, so I just want to really be clear about it. It was a, a statement saying that this is what's the, the proposal that was coming, the three proposals, and the impact that it would have on JFK, that third proposal, um, and that our survey had stated, you know, that, that parents and guardians and as well as our JFK community as a whole didn't want to see a change. So I just put that back out there to our school council and to our PTO on the listserv just to make sure people knew and understood that um, this was going to be a conversation and, and if they weren't informed that this is what was coming. I stated in that that the research clearly supports a later start time for our students and the high school students um, and that it was just, it was an informational email. So I. I think people may be aware, I don't know. I know that there were some people who instantly said to me they were gonna contact you. So, that's Thank what you. I know. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for speaking. Mr. Meyer. So, looking at this schedule, um, and then I'll get to my question eventually, Now I'll get to my question really quickly. Um, is there a reason that the high school can't start later than 815? If I roll the entire schedule back, the current proposal three, um, I roll the entire schedule back to maintain the middle school start time. I keep all of your proposed day lengths. Um, there has to be some slight adjustment of the elementary school start time from 850 to 855. Um, as far as the gaps between the, the proposed gaps and what I call my alternative gaps, it's 35 minutes middle to high school in the morning. It goes down from 40 to 25 high school to elementary in the morning, but that's actually the current gap. So if transportation is maintained at current levels, I wouldn't see it as a problem. It, it's as proposed in proposal three, it's 30 minutes in the afternoon middle to high school, 40 minutes high school to elementary. The alternative just, again, rolling that time back to the current middle school would be 30 minutes middle to high school, shaving five minutes off high school to elementary, but still by the same logic, that's greater than what we currently have. I'm just wondering if this was the case and it meets both the needs of keeping the middle school schedule where it is and it doesn't push the elementary school end time later than you propose in proposal three, it seems it only affects the high school taking it from 8.15 to 8.30. And so I'm wondering, was there something in the calculation that kept you from doing that? No. If you, you, know, you think that's a workable proposal number four, I'd be happy to take it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> There's no reason What time would we start the elementary school, though, then? 8.55. 8 8.55 to 325. So you're proposing only changing the Northampton High School. I'm not proposing anything. I'm just. This is. No, a, it's this, is you're, you're this is obviously. This is obviously the information. I, I, my question. My question was just. You know. I was trying to address. I obviously understand the superintendent and the transportation director and lots of other people in the community have spent months and months right. and months. So this was just a point of curiosity, looking at those adjustments and trying to factor them in with the current transportation gaps. I was just trying to see whether there was something that was keeping that 8.15 from being 8.30. Can you state what that idea was without all the rationale around yeah, Yes, yes. Um, the middle school day would be 7.55 to 2.30, yeah. which is, that's, that's the current learning time. The high school day would be 8.30 to 3 o'clock, which I believe is also still 6 hours and 30 minutes. The elementary school day would be 8.55 to 3.25, which is six hours and a half, which I believe is also the proposed learning time. And, and so, obviously there are lots of reasons that people come up for not liking elementary school starting five minutes later, uh, for not having the high school end at three. But I just wanted to see whether there was something that you had considered in the 815 time that, that would militate against that. I, if asked, I'd take that back and set it out with the transportation director and with the high school, and I could do that. How would that affect the athletics, which is one of the things that people have been saying all along, because it says as it gets later, there is a point where it's just too late for some of the athletics. I mean, is that why you stopped there, or is it just why not? 
that's something I would have to find out about. We did feel that 2.45 was about as late as we could go and not set into class time for away games and so forth. But again, you know, uh, Colin said 15 minutes, 15 minutes. So I'd have to go back and take a look at it and see how much class time they miss. It'll be easier once the mosquitoes are dead because then we'll be able to do night games. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> So I'd just like to say that you know, the agenda says that this is a report tonight and not a vote. And so my assumption is, is that it comes for a vote at our next meeting. And I had actually had the thought about, um, I, mean, I happened to like Proposal 3, but I was wondering if there was any tweaking involved, but I hadn't figured out how that actually worked. Um, I'm wondering if we, and I hate to do this to you, but I'm wondering if we can ask you to kind of vet that out with the administrators and the transportation director. and. Um, and um, maybe get back to us before the next meeting so we know what the thinking is and, and if there's a way of mm, compromising. It, yeah, and, um, <coughs> I, I, I just I really want to thank Nancy Athos because we've worked for years to have our administrators really embrace that whole K-12 perspective. And for her to say that she supports a later start time for her school, but that she really wants to support what her colleagues need across the district, just it really moved me. And I just really want to acknowledge her for doing that and thank you for that because I just think that's superb role modeling for what the K through 12 perspective is about. And I'd like to be able to support that view and be able to give our high school students what, what we think that we want to do. I mean, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, <coughs> and um, and just see if there's some tweaking. If it, you know, maybe if it's not 15 minutes at the middle school, maybe it's five or 10 minutes. If there's some kind of minor tweaking to a plan, I don't know if you want to do kind of a straw poll of the school committee just to see where we are about this and how many people are supporting um, a change and how many people are not. I'd be willing to do that, but. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that we could think about for our next meeting. Well, I have with to, the idea that it's time to vote and put this to bed, so to speak. Well, I have to <laughs> be honest and say that's kind of what I thought we were going to do mm -hmm. tonight. But with a live public meeting, you never know which direction right. you're going to. So I thought that I would uh, get the discussion started, and I thought we would do just that—that that people would share their feelings of where they are. And I think that would be good for the public mm -hmm. to know where you stand so that they can have a month to have input into the decision. Okay. Mr. Moore? Yeah, you know, I've, uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say anything more about the two-tier thing because, uh, you know, but um, in addition to the fact that we, we really think you need to explore this because I just was listening to Leslie Wilson say she'd like JFK to be later. And the principal is saying she'd like the high school to be later. And if you do a two-tier proposal, they will be. And the only one that will be earlier will be the elementaries, which in my whole time <coughs> here in Northampton, I've never heard parents complain about the elementaries being too early. But over and over about them being really late, it's really hard to get to work at 8.30, assuming you have to leave at 8, when the kid doesn't get on the bus till 8.30. It's really tough. You know, it's just about impossible, actually. You can do the math. And you can do that with a two-tier bus system to make that work. And you know, every spring we talk about how we don't have enough money for really vital programs to hire more teachers. And yet, just with the van pool, we save 20,000. <coughs> that's the only number I happen to have, is, is that for, for, for the five vans that are going to the high school on a separate tier, that it's, that's how many it is, how many dollars it is for them to go to the extra tier. You, you know, I don't know what it is on the yellow buses, but every tier costs something. And if, if so, say the yellow buses cost as much as the van does for a tier. That's two ES ESPs or a teacher. So I really think we ought to be maybe more ambitious with our proposals. I mean, I'm really happy actually with proposal number three. And I think, like the the things that Danny said and the things that Mr. Bubar said about there's some jiggering around that could make it work better and more smoothly with everybody, but. I think we should be more ambitious on this. You know, we've had for years and years, we've had people wanting to have late buses at the elementary, the middle school, and the high school. <coughs> we've never been able to do it. One of the reasons we've never been able to do it is because we were simply going to have to hire another tier. Whereas if we go to two tiers and we're combining people, so we're running ourselves much more efficiently. So essentially, you would have a late bus that would be a late bus for the high school and for JFK. 
which you could do really very practically. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you get into a situation where you can, with the same number of buses, be providing more service rather than running a bunch of partly empty buses, almost exclusively empty buses at the high school, because everybody at the high school does after school stuff, except for the poor kids who have to take the bus, which leaves at the moment the bell rings, and it's still late at JFK. Except for those kids, nobody rides the bus in the afternoon. But there would be tons of kids who would be riding the bus two and a half hours after school got out home from practice, because there's hundreds of those kids at practice. And the same thing at the middle school. They talk all the time about how they got this, and they do. They have a tremendous after school program that's only limit is the fact that most of their student body has to leave on the bus and can't participate in the after school program. So I think we, we really, are, by not being more ambitious with this, by not looking at sort of like, well, what can we do with start times, finish times, transportation, the really do these things which we've always wanted to do. Again, one of the things is when you go to two tiers, you can make both the middle school and the high school later. You can make the elementary school just a little earlier. It's like be, you know, sometime after 8 o'clock, which is in most people's window. When you talk to people, they say, something between 8 and 9. You know? Not after 9 is too much. Before 8 starts to be in the dark. And um, you can do that when you do two tiers. And so I really think we ought to be more ambitious and really look at that and look at the whole package rather than just trying to sort of speak just to get one thing, but as has been pointed out, that pushes another thing and not in a positive direction. Mr. Bourne? Then. Yeah, I was just going to say I would be in favor of um, having the superintendent look into this potential fourth proposal. I mean, there is something kind of troubling about if we believe in a later start time is good for uh, you know, ninth graders, why isn't it good for eighth graders and seventh graders and sixth graders as well? So um, that would be my suggestion, as Stephanie said. Um, well, my thought on it is that the research is not disputable, and that's what we keep going back to. So I think that I do support a later start time for the high school, and I would hope that it wouldn't be at the cost of the, the JFK students. However, all students will eventually benefit from it. So if we, if we save, it, it's 15 minutes is an hour and a quarter of sleep a week. 45 minutes is almost four hours a week of sleep that we're talking about the difference. Um, it would be nice if we could do it where JFK wasn't affected. But from my readings on the circadian rhythm and the research is that um, it's kind of like a curve, and it's not that kids all of a sudden hit an age where now we need to have more sleep that, or sleep in longer, that it actually, as they get older, they tend to stay up later and they can't get to sleep. And, and so I think that if we were to have anybody come a little earlier, I would support um, the third one. Um, and I don't think it's fair to ask the teachers, because of our K-12 um, to 12 perspective, to actually comment other than on how they personally feel about it because we could support the other teachers and support the other schools, but ultimately it's the students that need to be supported. And as far as um, Howard and his discussion goes on the two tiers, the only thing that I'd like to say doesn't really have to do with that. I know that we're having a bus con our contracts up next year, and I would just like to think that we're that we're aggressively looking at alternative ways and new ways to save money on that. And if it's a two-tiered system, then whatever. But I just think right now is an opportunity with the buses, the contract being open, to to consider whatever to make the costs go down. And I'm not advocating a two-tier. Um, you have a wonderful three-tier here. But with in the past, we've been in the middle of a contract. And we kind of are, but it's almost the end. And I just think if we kind of look ahead to see if there's anything we can do to save money in the future, like a year from now, and, and implement that in our five-year plan of a late start, you know, because you said, and I don't want to revisit it yearly either. But I do think that the, bus, the buses matter and the contract changes. So, um, and I do think that it's important that one of the people said that a loss of love of learning. I think that if we give our students anything, it should be the love of learning. <coughs> and Leslie said um, that the kids come in in their first and second class and they're not all awake and alert and everything else. I think that we need to just do the best that we can, and, and hopefully we can adjust the 15 minutes, but if we can't, I'd still support 
um, proposal three, knowing that the JFK students will ultimately get the benefit later on and might have to take a little bit of a hit at the beginning, but it's also at the beginning where their, where their bodies haven't yet come to fully needing, according to the research, that amount of, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a scale. They haven't come to the point where they absolutely need that amount at that point, so. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Um, is there shuffle? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I've got a bunch of folks over here. No, he, he was first. <coughs> um, I just wanted to, I wanted to echo what Alden said. I, I, one thing that has troubled me as I look at these proposals is, we seem to be saying, well, you know, this group of students, these middle schoolers, they can, they can suck it up for a while, you know, and, I, and that has always bothered me. I would echo the idea of exploring um, a, a proposal that would allow all the school to start late, because I don't think this is not a, a high school later start time discussion. It's a district start time discussion, and I think that gets lost. Um, and my concern has been all along that uh, because we talk about it in terms of a high school start time, elementary school parents and middle school parents may not even be paying attention to it, and it is going to affect them. Um, so I just wanted to second my vote or second the idea of exploring the Downey's proposal. Ms. Minnick. Uh, that's almost exactly what I was going to say. Um, Downey, I mean, excuse me, Alden said a little while ago, you know, 15 minutes is, you know, some some people will ask, it's 15 minutes, it's only 15 minutes. But it's, if it were 15 minutes later, everybody would be happy. But it's 15 minutes earlier than what the middle school kids have been doing now. And it's only 10 minutes different from what we've said was not good for high schoolers. And that bothers me a lot. We talked about a proposal that had no cost to it. And I, I s pr propose that there is a cost. It's not a monetary cost in busing. It's a cost for the staff members that have to now find, make alternative arrangements so that they can get to work even earlier than the 7.40 start time. Now, they, th it's, it's problems for parents and teachers and, and students. And I think that it's not fair to penalize the middle school to accomplish something at the high school, particularly when the middle schoolers are so close in age. And I'm not sure that you can say this is the day that the cutoff happens when your circadian rhythm changes. I, I, I also believe that it's a statistical thing. Most kids need more sleep starting about this age. But there are some kids who, my, my kids, when they were in kindergarten, didn't want to get up in the morning. I mean, they weren't the like early risers that most young children are. There are differences from family to family and from child to child and I think it's just unfair of us to to force one to pay the penalty so that others can have what they need. Um, and, I, and I don't mean to say that what we're trying to get for the high schoolers is not important. It is. So it's a very difficult thing for me to say that but I just don't want to, to make it be a cost for someone else that may not know about it, like you said. And um, I am concerned a little bit about your proposal, although I'm not completely familiar with it, because Van Poole, yours, Howard, I'm not, I thought Van Poole was a separate contract and that it was mostly something altogether different. And so I may need to go back and do some research on, on how it happens. But I really thought that that was mostly for some of our special needs students. Yes. And so to say that we should just factor Van Poole into making a two-tiered system, which if I also understood you correctly, involved mixing two age levels that also caused some concern for a lot of people, makes it, if, if we can figure out a way to do number four Downey's proposal and have it work, then I'm all for that. Otherwise, I'm very torn between number three and number one because my preference would probably be number two, but I realize that it puts the elementary schools so late and it makes another nightmarish problem for parents who have to be at work and it leaves the kids coming home later in the day. So, I mean, there's, I, I don't know what the best solution is I, and so I'm glad that I'm only one of ten people making that decision. My vote is just part of it. But I really do appreciate you're doing the analysis of it. S having said that, however, I, if I, had, I, I would think that if number four could work, that would be my preference. 
Mr. Zahowski. A lot of things have already been said, so I won't uh, try to rehash everything, but I'll pick up where Ms. Minnick left off. I think if we look at proposal number two, right, and we say, well, this one really makes a lot of sense. It gives everybody pretty much what they want. What it doesn't give is it doesn't give parents what they want because a 920 start time doesn't allow, like what Howard said, you know, parents being able to get to work on time. But this started off about kids needing more sleep, and now proposal number two is off because it doesn't work for parents. So I think. As the superintendent said, this conversation started off because kids need more sleep. And um, when we look at the proposal number three, it takes some sleep away from the JFK kids. And I'm not sure um, that that's, that's the best thing either. I, I've heard comments that have been troubling to me, like, um, well, they can take one for the team. Um, I think Leslie Wilson would agree, and Nancy Athis would too, that the success of our high school kids um, doesn't just start in ninth grade, it starts in sixth grade, in seventh grade, and in eighth grade. So although I applaud the success of the high school in what has happened at the high school and the excellence and the achievement that we have at the high school, I think we'd be remiss to not acknowledge all the hard work that's <coughs> happening at the elementary schools and at the middle school. So if we cause a detriment to the middle schoolers by not allowing them to get that extra 15 minutes sleep, how do you think that that might affect the high school kids when they get there? And so when I hear comments like, when it counts the most at the high school, it worries me and troubles me because when it counts the most is when our students enter kindergarten. And not just when they enter as a ninth grader at the high school. And so I would have a hard time supporting even number three because of what it does to a group of kids who, and I have this group of kids um, and I've talked to doctors, uh, pediatricians, and done my own research, and I'm living puberty in my house right now, and for, well, not personally. <laughs> but for girls, the average is 10 and a half, and for boys, it's 11 and a half on average, and we talk about the slope. And um, I've got a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old. And so that's kind of why I said I'm living puberty at home. So <coughs> they both go to JFK. And circadian rhythms and the change is tied to the onset of puberty. And then we start going up that hill, right? And so yes, I think my kids too at the middle school level are affected by sleep. And they need that sleep too. And I'm not of the mindset to say that four years is better than three. I'm of the mindset that says that we have to look at the system as a whole. And so I, I too take the approach and I, I, I support the administrators and their way of thinking. And as Ms. Pick said earlier, a K through 12 vision needs to take place when making this decision. Um. Can we just keep coming right along here since we haven't heard from Mr. Lynn? Um, I'm going to take a little different stand. Uh, I've said this before, but I'll say it in a different way. Uh, one of the things that's always frustrated me as an educator is every day I would go and I teach. And I'd work with students, and I, I did my job. I'm on the ground, I'm working, I know what I need to do. And my colleagues know what they need to do. Our administrator would know what he needed to do to run the school, and we had a, a vision. And occasionally, outside entities would, would come in and, and propose something or would deny something that would get in the way of what we were trying to do. And so an example would be, uh, we were trying to do something at Norris that involved technology. And some members of the school board didn't like Apple computers. And that's where, what a lot of us want to do. Now, this is not an apples to apples comparison. <laughs> one, I'm intended. But um, 
give some perspective. And so most of us as faculty members wanted to do this work. And yet, because of some other people's opinion, we were not going to get the technology that we needed to do our job. And instead, they were going to put something in place that didn't work for us. And we would say, this is not something that we support. And it didn't matter. It was, it was, so there's something very frustrating about that. And as an educator, I, I really like to respect the voices of those on the ground. And as a school board, I try to remember my role as oversight and as uh, setting policy and, and approving budgets, but trusting to the leaders. And if there were a split, if there was some debate among the, the administrative leadership team about, about this issue, if, um, if it was 90% of the staff said we want to have this, then I could see having more room for debate. But what I'm seeing is uh, unanimous uh, so the unanimous vote from the administrative leadership team uh, not to go ahead with it. They want to focus on other things. And with the split with the staff, and I've talked with enough teachers to hear that, and I, I don't want to propose something or impose something that is not something that's part of their vision. So I want to just put that out there as another perspective, and that's my sense on the issue. I'm not saying that four years is better than three, and I would agree with you not to um, value, put different values on the different education. All I think it comes down to is what can we do, how can we do the best for the students? And to keep saying the research is, is not disputable, but, and then to fill in any blank makes no sense to me. I think that we need to go with what the research is and do what we can. Hopefully, we can come up with another alternative and, and shave off some of that 15 minutes in at JFK, but what we're talking about is a difference of adding almost four hours sleep versus a little over, losing a little over one over the period of a week for the kids. And it's not the best, and it may not be the best, but sometimes we have to make those decisions based on what's the best for everybody. And as far as change goes, people are often hesitant to change. And it's a 60-40 at the high school um, in support of I mean, in not in support of change. And I think that it just needs to be remembered, one, that change is hard, but two, that we have to do just the most that we can, and maybe we can't fix it all the way, but just do the best that we can to make sure that it is the best for everybody without putting a valuation on high school is more important than kindergarten, because I don't think it is. I think that it's all one big system. So, and I don't think it's take one for the team. It's there we have a lull, unfortunately. And hopefully, we can work something out where we don't have that lull, where we don't have to say JFK is losing 15 minutes. You know, but it's not like we're saying JFK is. That's your, your, your children. My daughter's in fifth grade this year, so next year she will be losing it, knowing that further down the road she will have more energy because she'll be gaining three and, a, three, three, and three quarters hours of sleep that week. So I just, I just think that it really needs to be weighed that way. And I, and I would have to support the research. The research is not disputable. I mean, everybody says that, so I think that we need to go with the research. Well, let me be clear. I, my son will be a ninth grader next year, and so whatever change occurs will not affect him. So I'm not lobbying for my kids. My kids didn't say, Dad, go to the meeting tonight and tell them we don't want to get up 15 minutes earlier because it's not going to affect my son, you know. And oh, it'll affect my daughter, and she'll say, what were you doing at that meeting saying, go 15 minutes earlier? I want to sleep. <laughs> yeah. My comments were simply directed at the mm -hmm. fact that some group is going to have to get up earlier, and that group who needs sleep. Mm -hmm. I agree. Other comments or discussion? Yes. I sort of wanted to acknowledge the elephant, elephant in the room, which I think is the budget. I mean, this is an, another case where we're trying to, to solve a problem saying we're not going to spend any money on it. And so the solution is to impact the, some of the kids' education. I just think it's uh, for people watching that it's kind of unfortunate, but that's where we are. So oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm very curious <laughs> about seeing it that way. I mean, so if we leave it the way it is, we're not impacting the education of any student. But if we were to go with proposal number three as proposed, we would be harming the education of some students, even though it's not, even though they're younger, so the, the whole circadian rhythm thing has had less effect on them. And even though it's not as early as our current high school kids, 
it seems to me that's that's a net improvement no matter how you slice it and so I don't think it's saying that we're harming anybody by doing that. I didn't that. say we're harming you. I'm saying if, opposed if, to spending if, we, money. if we had a lot more money in the district, we could get all the kids to school when we wanted to get them to school, exactly. right? That's what we would do. Yes. But we, we don't have the money to do yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's right. Point. Well, and that's also been my point about how I think we need to work <coughs> harder on, because if the discussion is about whether or not you want to have you know, elementary kids and high school kids on the same vehicles, then that should be the discussion as opposed to what's just not possible. I think that's not a really fair thing, and um, because it would, well, two tiers using the same number of vehicles is less expensive, and we do have budget issues. So we, um, uh, Ms. Pickett mentioned about trying to come to some kind of, or maybe do an informal straw poll, or just try to work through each one of these, and and with the idea that there, there's going to be, uh, we've asked, we're going to ask the superintendent to look at this fourth solution, but I think it's important. We've already heard some people say, like Ms. Duvall, I think um, you said that uh, favor the fourth proposal, but in the absence of that, you should support the I third, have to support what is the, third the most proposal. best. Okay. The and I'm, best. I'm sensing that's where you are as well, <laughs> Mr. Moore as well. Yeah. I know. Okay. Um, do other folks have a, an, um, in terms of where you, where you are in this? Um, I was... Uh, I was. I would like to hear about number four if it's possible. And after that, I, I'm. I'm very torn. But if backed into a corner, I'd probably say one. Stay okay. the same. Okay. Um, any? Do you have any sense at this point? I think the research is clear that the circadian rhythm changes begin with pure with the onset of puberty, and that the onset of puberty is not magically ninth grade. And so I think that you need to recognize that. I also feel strongly as a former middle school science and math teacher that the thought that there are, again, just to reiterate, that there are more important years and less important years is so educationally unsound. <laughs> um, and again, the thought that we're sitting here saying, well, we'll hurt this group of kids for a shorter, shorter amount of time than we'll you know, benefit this group of kids is not a way I would like to make this decision. So I, I think either to see if the adjustment that I suggested could work, otherwise it could be a very difficult choice for me between three and one. I think you were fairly clear about one being the preference at this point, and I'm not sure how you, um, if you're still in, if you're in that same situation. Okay. I, I would, I'd be supporting proposal number one. Um, and I would like to hear proposal number four, but I know I spoke to, to Jim Miller in that, around athletics. He kind of was around that number of 30 minutes, 45 minutes. That was doable. This obviously would move it even farther. Uh, being a high school coach myself and a teacher in high school on block scheduling with kids that leave my classroom on average twice a week to attend soccer games in the fall golf matches in the fall and the like, I know that uh, if my school was getting out at 3 o'clock and the bus was leaving at 1.30, the impact that would have on student learning. And I think any longer you go um, without having a, a strong commitment from area schools that they're going to start their competitions later um, is really detrimental to, to learning for students. Uh, we even heard tonight about uh, a student taking an AP Spanish class, leaving that class twice a week early in order to uh, attend a Smith uh, class 15 minutes twice a week, and how the instructor was really, um, you know, reluctant to allow that and was very concerned about that 15 minutes of material that would be missed. Uh, I can tell you from, from my own experience that it's happening even with much more content missing. And I would be concerned with the with the proposal for because of how that would impact in in the afternoon. And I think our if we go over the river, we look at Amherst. Amherst stalled on the athletics issue because the competitions that they have with area schools, um, they could not really find a feasible way to to handle that. And it was around time. And any farther we go into the afternoon, I think um, will only uh, make it more difficult for that change from the athletic standpoint. So, yeah, my proposal uh, would be one at this point. Okay. 
do other folks have a strong opinion at this point in terms of wanting to at least express where they are in terms of just in a straw poll sort of setting or I'm going to speak to what Ed said about sure. the athletics. I just, you know, I, I don't, I, right now, for example, this fall, all the soccer games that the high school has are scheduled at 4 o'clock or later. Okay, the ones that are scheduled at 4 o'clock, the, the away ones, like in Agawam and places like that, you know, they're still hanging around at the high school for 45 minutes or an hour before the bus leaves. So, and you could easily schedule those games at 4.30 or 5 because it it's not getting dark yet. And by the end of the soccer season, when the mosquitoes will be all dead, <laughs> what I'm saying is right now there's slack in there between the end of the school day of about an hour anyway between the buses leaving. So I think it's, it's not so much a question of the school day scheduling, it's a question of the competition scheduling. And, you know, I'm sorry, but athletic directors can move it from 3.30 to 4 or from 4 to 4.30. I mean, they can do that. And, I, mean, that's, and I think that's you. really the tail wagging the dog if we let our school schedule be based on uh, end competitions. I think, I think you have to look at area communities and their resources. We have a problem even here in Northampton mm -hmm. with um, field usage. Oh, absolutely, the sheriff. So um, high schools compete <coughs> with uh, town rec. Mm -hmm. leagues as well and so you say Howard it's, it's easy to move a competition from 4 to 4 30 because it doesn't get dark but the rec leagues are using that same field at 5 15 for a for a girls soccer youth soccer game and you can't really schedule very few high school fields are used that way they're almost all used just by the high school you know I, well, it's where we I, no, the, where we have I mean, a I mean, Howard what I'm saying is not 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 here I, and I'll just use East Hampton as a point okay. because that's where I'm from uh, well, where I oh, teach, yes. right? Not obviously from a problem. I want to be on the school committee, but the, the reality is that there isn't. There's a there's an overlap. Yeah. We couldn't say, well, we're going to start a game at 4:45 in East Hampton because the fields that the junior varsity use for that competition are shared with the rec leagues in town, and so something needs to give. Right. What gives is we're going to start the game earlier in the afternoon so that at 5:15 or 5:30 the fields are clear so that mm -hmm. the rec the rec leagues can use it. Right. I understand that, and that's right. that's again that's what Jeffrey Bubar was talking about. You know, we really do. There, there will be those, but those are the kinds of things around the edges compared to, again, the research is really clear. And, and, and you know, if what we're saying is that we're content to leave those points in, in, you know, academic performance, those points in terms of health, those points in terms of um, participation in after school activity, actually, those studies show an increase again because kids are less tired. If we're willing to leave all that stuff forget about it because of the sort of the, the stuff around the edges in terms of yeah finding a place to practice you know I think that's a misplaced priority mr. Bourne yeah just in terms of a straw poll I mean I, I just want to really kick the tires I mean I'm kind of hesitant to put too much faith in this magical fourth proposal because I don't even I, mean, I think it's great to explore but who knows if it's <laughs> even viable but I would really like to kick the tires in that before um, you know, figuring out whether I'd, I'd, I'd prefer to figure out a way not to uh, change the JFK start time if possible. Um, you mean not to make it earlier? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I mean, I, I think it's worth, I also want to really figure out what's going on with athletics because I think athletics is an important part of the day, but again, I want to make sure it's not the tail wagging the dog in terms of what the, I mean, it's probably a dangerous thing to say, but what the mission is of our schools. And I want to make sure that we're not focusing too much on athletics at the expensive the education of the kids okay just in terms of the athletics if we actually manage to vote this next month it gives our athletic director nearly a year with hit to work this out with the community coaches and the other districts it seems to me that there's going to have to be some collaboration other school districts are looking at this also and I, I'd like to think that we could have some faith that that could be worked out So, all right, so uh, are folks comfortable? Um, I mean, let me just say for myself, um, as I, I, I'll be voting on this as well. Um, I kind of have the, the, um, the perfect case. I have a 13-year-old who's in middle school, and I have a 14-year-old who's in high school. 
Uh, and I can tell you, there's um, it's no easier to get one of them out of bed than it is to get the other one out of bed. I mean, it's it's a struggle, and even the 14-year-old had struggle when she was in middle school. So I, I don't see a big variation in terms of the challenges between the middle school and the high school. So I do think it will be difficult for me, um, and I've already heard from a lot of JFK parents about this, to make a change to improve the high school start time that's then going to adversely affect JFK. So I'm sort of in that <coughs> same position. Um, and obviously the 920 is, uh, is just is difficult. That's that. We went through that at Bridge Street School when we tried to talk about doing an extended learning day and just that whole issue of people needing to get to work and, and the time is so critical there. So I think that's the other issue with that one. So at this point, I'm, I'm sort of in that same camp of, of, uh, of going with the administrative team uh, unless we can figure out a way to do that without an impact on on the whole system. If we can make a change that's positive that isn't going to then have a, a negative effect on one other part of the system. That's sort of where I'm at at this point. So it sounds like we've got kind of a mix of folks who are willing to support three, folks who are open to the idea of four, but um, but in the absence of that at one. So it it's, it's could be a, a good discussion next time. So are we comfortable? ending it at this point and asking the superintendent to ask uh, the, the transportation coordinator to, to run that one and get us some information about it? I'm yes and no comfortable with it. I, I'll be honest, we, we charged the superintendent with coming to us with three proposals and now we're going back for a fourth. My and the first one is not it's not even the one that some of us want. <laughs> my, my proposal is after hearing, you know, from other members of the school committee that there might be a, a fifth coming out in October or another tweaking of something. He, the superintendent, was asked to do something by the school committee and to come back with three proposals was was great. It was more than probably anyone. Could even imagine, and a lot of thought, a lot of work went into this. And I, I'm, I won't call it disrespectful, but I, I think we're almost going um, back on our word. We said that we wanted to, him to bring something to us, and that we would look at those proposals and make a decision on that. And now we're asking him to to do more. And my concern is that at the next meeting, what's going to stop us from doing more or asking him to do more again? I think there's other things that we can get to and we should be getting on to, and that we have three proposals here. And these yeah. perhaps should be the ones we should be considering. Well, uh, well there's actually only two proposals because the first one doesn't change, so that's not really a change. But, but there is but, a change in the start time. Uh, there's a, there's a in the hour for the elementary. So in the elementary, but that was what we what we what we charged them. We charged them. I, I understand that, but not for the um, Hamp High, and that's who we charged them with. I would agree to keep going it, but if we all state that it's number four or one and we took a straw poll and we all are moving in the direction, then, I mean, this has been going on, I guess, for what, five to eight years, six to nine years, something like that, um, according to the superintendent. And for us to say, okay, well, I think that's quick enough because out of disrespect, I think that if we can, as opposed to looking at it collaboratively, such as Downey coming up with a new idea and all of us bringing our own feelings to it. But first of all, there's only two proposals for the high school that we, we charged him, I mean, that he's brought back to us. And I'm not saying that he should have had five proposals, and I'm not saying, you know, but we are saying, all of us, from what I hear and from what I wrote down, is that two isn't really enough if we can tweak one a little bit more, so could you please come back with one three? We're not saying to him, scrap the whole thing, we don't like any of it, just start all over again. Because I, I mean, I very much would like to say, Superintendent Salzer, that I think that you've done a, a, a great job and I think that you've put a lot of responsibility and, and taken a lot of responsibility of going out and having the forums and getting the information and that you gave us a wonderful ideas and proposals here in what I consider number two and three. The first one to me isn't actually a change, so it's not a proposal other than the elementary. But, and I don't think that we're throwing it all out. I think that it's just a matter of tweaking it a little. And I don't think asking about the little things is disrespectful. I would actually think it would be more disrespectful to the whole board to expect us to just say, okay, since he did this, we're going to just take it as is, as opposed to, great job, superintendent. How about just a little bit of this and maybe everybody can work it out? That's, you know. 
So there's there are only two, and I and I'm hoping that we're not coming at all across as disrespectful to you in 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 trying to get our goals met. You know, I mean, and especially considering that you stated right from the beginning the research is indisputable. Just for us, I think it would be irresponsible for us to have the research, to know it, to go through all these years of looking at it and the studies and everything else to all of a sudden say, okay, well, since you gave us two, we'll just go with that. So um, that's just what I want to say. Mr. Bourne. I was just going to add, to add on to that. I mean, I, I take your point, Ed, but I think if, if in response to Downey, the superintendent had been able to say, that wouldn't work and here's why, that's why I didn't look at it, then I think it would be a different story. But we're not in that position, and, and if it's still a possibility, I think we need to explore it. So. Um, it's not my first choice, but I think it's I think it's worth doing, and I think we can hopefully have a vote in October and get it done. Agreed, and and I wasn't saying that I think Downey's idea is a great idea. My caution was that next month it would be nice to vote on it yeah. and move on. Yes, so I agree. I'm concerned, being uh, my fifth year on this on this committee, <laughs> that what happens is is things get kicked down. The street month by month by month and the superintendent has been great about setting up uh, uh, a schedule with dates and deadlines and, and he's come back to us with something and we have a fresh superintendent a pretty fresh superintendent we have a, 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 he's, a, he's weathering so an opportunity for a fresh, we have a fresh start so I, i'm just hoping that we're not going to continue with some of our bad habits that's all and so yeah. I, I it wasn't i wasn't I wasn't saying that you know there there shouldn't be any tweaking or there shouldn't be any you know scrutiny over what's been brought back to us. My concern is that we shouldn't be prolonging this any longer than. I just want to say that fresh as in <laughs> not stinky or fresh as in really sassy or <laughs> fresh as in like oh, new, <laughs> new legs. <laughs> new legs. Well, yeah. I, I have I have Mr. Meyer. I have tremendous respect. <laughs> for the superintendent. Um, I actually began meddling in this shortly after coming onto the committee. In fact, I got a phone call from the interim superintendent with some suggestions of start times because he was batting them around and he put me in touch with Joy Winnie. So I felt that was perhaps beyond what I should be doing. And so when the superintendent proposed that this was something that the administrative leadership team, his team should handle, I thought, that's a great idea because we, as a, as we are the decision-making body, but he has the knowledge, and he has the access to information to come up with proposals. But I do think, however, that we still retain the ultimate decision-making authority. And I think I could go back and review the minutes that we asked him to come forward with a proposal. And I think that my understanding is that whatever proposal he comes forward with that there might be modifications suggested. Again, I have no desire to see this go on forever either. And I think it's from the straw poll, my sense is that most of us want to make a decision and have it stand at the next meeting. But again, as Alden said, if the superintendent comes back and says, I looked at this and there's, you know, and again, if I didn't think that the information was already accumulated to answer the question as to whether my suggestion could work, I might not have asked him to go off on this wild goose chase. But I think that in the nine, six, five, three, you know, one year that we've been accumulating information, that the answer as to whether this additional tweak could work is already there. And it won't take very much time for the superintendent to come back with an answer. Mr. Moore. Yeah, and I would agree with you, Ed. I think that uh, <laughs> we need to, we need to, you know, this discussion has been going on forever. And uh, we need to get end. But part of that is, if you're going to do an end, if you're not going to continually bring it up for revisions and editings and things, you need to have made sure that you put to bed all the competing concerns. Because otherwise, they will wake up again next year. And you will, it will be back in front of us. So I think it's, you know, I'm an interest in finality, but I'm not a real big fan of saying, then no matter what, we just drop dead on that date. because. If, if, we have, if we drop dead on that date, we don't drop dead. You know, the issues keep coming. You know, kids still need more sleep. If, so if we, you know, if we leave our schedule the way it is, this issue won't go away because you will still have kids. Again, all those benefits of, of a later start time, which we've all agreed exist, will continue, we will be continuing to push those off the table and not accept those benefits. <laughs> 
you know? So that, that will always be there as an issue, in, unless we have actually addressed all the reasons why we cannot do it. And I think it's pretty clear we can, and we probably even can without spending more money, and we probably can spending even less money on transportation. So what we need to do is deal with all those things to find out whether I'm completely wrong, that we could actually not save money and also have middle school and high school start later. Because, and we need to know why I'm completely wrong on that. And if we can't find that out in a month or two, then we'll be still wanting to find out in six months or in five years. Because, because it seems like, again, given our budget pressures, which won't go away, I don't think, and given the reality of kids needing more sleep, which isn't going to go away anytime soon, evolution's not happening that fast, you know, we're, those, those things won't go away. You know, we could hope they would go away, but they won't. So I think it's really important that both we get to a final decision, because I think it's a waste of our time to dribble along, but I also think it's important that we get there in a way that satisfies everybody that, okay, that's done. Satisfies it's actually the majority. been done. Well, it satisfies enough of us, yeah. yeah. Right. But I think that the respect has to do with the, in the knowing why it won't work. I don't really think that we need to know why it won't work. I think that there comes a point where we trust the superintendent that he's gone through everything and that he can basically tell. And, and the areas where it might work to tweak it, those are worth examining. But in the vein of respect, I do think that, that we shouldn't question as far as whether or not why it won't work. I, I would, I would assume that at this point that we can just accept the fact that you know you you're going to do what we asked and come back and give us the best workable answers and to go through and just break it apart I think would be disrespectful I just but I don't feel that that that's what I feel I mean I I would like to um, you do the best you can and that's it and if it doesn't work just okay and see what can work and if we can approach it from a positive stance of what more can we do um, to make sure that the research being undisputed helps our kids. Okay, so uh, it sounds like we're ready to kind of conclude this for tonight. Um, and we've done some straw polls, we sort of know where people stand. Uh, we've asked you to do a quick analysis of this other potential proposal. And the commitment of the group is we come back at the next meeting and we take a final vote on, on whichever proposal we decide to support, okay? Okay, so uh, let's move on. Um, the next item is, uh, this is a report from the superintendent and this is about our private and charter school approvals. All right, so um, my understanding going into this was that uh, my job to go to visit the private schools, analyze and observe their curriculum, their classrooms, their facilities, talk to them about teacher quality and so forth and come back to you uh, with my stamp of approval that you could vote for approval of the private schools and my understanding was that that was an annual event. You find out it's not. I only need to do that when a private school first opens or if there's a substantial change to the school. So we checked with Glenn Kutcher from MASC and he said that uh, it was great that I visited all the schools. <laughs> I, I was thrilled about it too because I got to meet a lot of people and I got to see all of our schools in Northampton as well as the schools um, that our kids go to but are not in our city. We have new schools, no new schools for you to vote in, and uh, I'm very proud that I got to visit those schools. <laughs> hey, Brian, Brian. Yeah. This may be a ridiculous I question. Wilson. Oh, I know, I know, but, but how, if, if you don't visit the schools every year, how do you know if there's been a substantive change or not? Like, our, if our approval is just like open ended, blank check <laughs> approval? I have the answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that the law, Chapter 76, Section 1, says that I only need to bring it to you for approval when a new private school opens. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so is that okay. the result so of our phone call? No required vote on <laughs> Sorry. that. Sorry. Um, no required vote on that. So we can move on to the <laughs> curriculum overview. Uh, and uh, Ms. McKenna is here. <laughs> very polite for not groaning with dismay because all of you know how much I like to talk. <laughs> um, but I will, I did send you a, just a, a brief overview 
And um, so, I, and I certainly would love to answer any questions that you might have about um, the direction that we're going in this curriculum this year. But I want to start off with publicly, if anybody's still awake, um, acknowledging all the work that has been done over the summer by the faculty. They spent over um, 1,200 hours this summer in teacher teams working on um, aligning our Northampton public school curriculum with the new Massachusetts uh, 2011 uh, frameworks, curriculum frameworks, which are aligned with the new Common Core, which the, Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts has adopted. That's a significant amount of work, and um, the work that they've done has been really very useful and will be continued during the school year. And I want just to say it publicly because everybody thinks teachers have the summer off. And actually, our teachers put in what would be the equivalent of 200 days <coughs> over the summer of, of work. And I think they need, really need to be acknowledged for that. Uh, in addition to the work on the Common Core, uh, teachers at uh, the schools, as particularly at Leeds, spent a week um, getting trained in responsive classroom uh, strategies. Um, teachers in the elementary schools also participated in a week-long reading uh, course given by a professor from uh, Westfield State College. Uh, teachers participated in data analysis, um, individual court, they did individual coursework. They have been really remarkably um, busy over the summer in um, preparing um, themselves and our school, our curriculum um, for the new changes that are coming forward with the uh, new mass frameworks on the common core. I want to say that. So <coughs> um, I gave in my, in the, in the handout that you got, it basically listed three main goals. One was aligning the curriculum with the time floor. That's a major requirement that uh, all um, schools in Massachusetts are doing. And over in the next few years, they're working on a new assessment program, which is going to be called PARC, P-A-R-C-C, um, which is an assessment program more in line with the new frameworks and the Common Core. And it will replace the MCAS eventually. It, it'll be an assessment program that will replace the actual MCAS test. Um, and that will be, uh, it, it's still in the development stages, so it'll be several years before that comes out. But what we need to do is make sure the curriculum and the teaching in the classrooms is aligned with what's going to be tested on those. Uh, exams when those tests are um, created. Um, also using, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about aligning with the Common Core, but I also want to just mention the other two um, basic areas that we're going to be looking at this year for curriculum. One is using data to plan student learning. Um, it's something that we have all been learning over the past few years, but we're really um, going to be focusing this year on sitting down with the data that teachers collect on the work that students do in the classroom and then figure out how to how to use that data to plan the actual lessons that the children are learning, um, uh, experiencing in the classroom and then um, how to assess um, the student progress so that's a ma uh, the second major goal and the third major goal is we don't want to end any of the initiatives that we are currently in the process of doing. What we want to do is strengthen them and consolidate them and really make sure that we are providing the level of support that we need to maintain the, the initiatives and keep them going. We're, other than infusing technology um, in a more syst systematic way into the classroom, there's really not any brand new uh, curriculum initiatives that are coming up. Um, mostly what we're looking at is making sure we're doing a very good job with the curriculum initiatives that we all have already um, made a priority. And I listed those. Uh, readers and Writers Workshop, Tools of the Mind, Math Investigations, the Response to Intervention, 
the uh, alignment of the math uh, structure from math instruction from uh, sixth grade through 12th grade and at the high school and middle school level, the reading and writing across the curriculum. So I don't, I mean, I can go on and on and give you lots of information about the Common Core, at, but you know what? I think it's better for you to just ask me what you're interested in knowing about um, the development of curriculum, and I would be more than happy to meet with small groups, do s some other kind of presentation. I'm in the process now of putting together a, a website for curriculum, and I'm hoping that that will give people access, you know, to more, to articles and things about the various curriculum <coughs> uh, priorities that are, and hot topics in education, so that if you wanted more information, it would be easy to find it. Um, I certainly don't want to just stand up and give you a bunch of information that sounds like education ease <laughs> and um, isn't very practical for you. So I guess I'd just like to open to questions if that's okay. Mr. Moore and then Ms. Baker. I think my, my question when I see these things is, is just the feasibility question. You know, I've looked at, you know, it's common for stuff. You know, it's, it's a lot of stuff. And um, I guess, I have two questions. Is, is it feasible to teach it all? And then it's going to be tested. And is it feasible to teach it all if you're also actually trying to basically teach to the test? So, you, so in other words, will the test show whether or not people have learned all that material or will, once again, we'll be in this cycle where we have a whole lot more stuff we want kids to learn, but in order to show they've learned it, we'll have to skip some of that stuff or rather change our focus so that we're working on making sure we get good scores on a test. That is such Because I don't see how you could test all the stuff in the Common Core in even a couple of weeks of testing. I mean, it's right. a lot of stuff in there. I guess that's such an excellent question, Howard, because um, when I've been looking at the Common Core, what I've noticed is really I feel like there's been an evolution and a sophistication that's in the Common Core that wasn't in, say, when, they, when people were um, writing the MCAS test for the first time. And what the Common Core emphasizes is really depth over you know, breadth. Mm -hmm. So um, it really focusing in on getting students at starting at preschool kindergarten to really be thinking in a much more deep way and I th and so to answer the question I think that if we are really focusing not only on content but also on really thinking skills and really helping kids think deeply and creatively about what they're learning about even at younger ages then by the time they're taking the uh, tests, they will be more able to use the text um, in the question and go back and refer to it. They will be more able to use inferential thinking or other kinds of ways of um, uh, analyzing because up till now, it really has been content, like you were saying, <coughs> certain amount of facts that people have to learn. Right. Um, and the big change, or one of the big shifts that I see in the, in the Common Core is a shift away from, you know, bunches of facts to know toward more really the process, the process approach and the real um, learning how to be thinking and, and applying what you know in uh, with the information that you're getting, not just the kind of superficial content, like um, the comment was made about, I, I, I did my AP French and exam, and now I never have to speak French again. It's gonna be a little bit more about really understanding how to approach uh, a problem in real life in a more deep way, okay. regardless of what subject it is. So I, you know, when you look at the document, it is a really nice, powerful document. Um, and I do think that it can be used in a very bad way, um, but I think it has a lot of potential. Okay. Ms. Pick. 
Um, I think my question is related. It has to do with the, the statement that you made about um, um, training for the, the new kind of testing that's going to come out. But in the meantime, the kids are still taking the MCATs. So how do kids and teachers prepare for the MCAS while learning to make the shift for That is another parts. excellent question. <laughs> because actually the Department of Ed is really doing a lot of that work for us. Um, what you're going to see when we are finally able to present the MCAS data is that they are the reporting, they're reporting it out differently. And so in the past, under the old scheme, for example, they would, uh, you would get uh, on the uh, 2006 ELA standards or whatever. What you would get as you drill down into the data is how many, how well kids did on questions related to poetry or how well did kids do on questions related to grammar, you know, that type of thing. Whereas on the 2011 standards, the, the, what you're, you're being rated on is can kids find the, the main idea and how are they at synthesizing the information and using it and applying it in a different way. So it's a much higher order thinking that is being uh, assessed. Does that mean that we're going to move away from assessing the basics like grammar? Because that, that, that's important too. It is important too, but it may not be, it's not necessarily important on this type of a test. You know, that's why you have to have many different kinds of assessments. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessary that <coughs> an MCAS type test assess, you know, a basic, more basic skills like grammar. What they're trying to do is make sure that all the students are college ready. So they're really trying to make sure that kids have the skills, the thinking skills, the anal analytical skills to be able to do college level work. It sound, I mean, for years we weren't all that impressed with some of what was coming from the state. It sounds like some of that is starting to change. Well, this is not just the state. This is the national, this is the national uh, standards. These are national standards that are being applied across the country. And really a lot of, you know, very serious thinking and consideration and also all the experience that all the states like Massachusetts and everybody else have gone through in terms of trying to use these, trying to standardize the curriculum across the state, and trying to use these kinds of tests to assess student learning. And what they found was, well, everybody knew, for example, that AYP, making children, all children accessible by 2013 was, a, was an arbitrary deadline and it wasn't really going to happen. You know, and so the new, the new uh, focus is away from that particular focus on individuals and more towards closing the achievement gap at, with a much more reasonable time frame. So it really changes, it cha there are, anyway, it's, it's, that's why I'd love to be able to have other time <laughs> to Just probably one sit in. Very quick question, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to this, but what is Tools of the Mind? Tools of the Mind is um, right now um, the Bridge Street School kindergartens are using a um, program called the Tools of the Mind and it's basically a totally integrated developmental program based on the work of Lev Vygotsky and um, based on how developmentally how children learn um, which in our very limited experience because we're part of a pilot study where they're assessing whether or not it's effective. Um, we have found that using the techniques and in, in tools with, that are being used in tools of the mind, um, kill, children are learning how to learn. They're learning how to uh, regulate their emotions and their attention. And by the end of the year, kids were doing work in kindergarten voluntarily without stress and without any kind of a hassle that we wouldn't see probably before November in first grade on a typical uh, it, you know, in the way that we had done it before, because how the teaching was happening was more in line with how children at that age learn. And the teachers are thrilled with it and so excited. And they went in a little skeptical, you know, but they've seen the difference. I have never, at the end of the year, had a teacher walk into my office and say, oh my God, I can't believe what the kids can do. This has been the best year of teaching. And um, so we're pretty excited about it. We're hoping that it's something that, that will 
demonstrate enough benefit to um, spread out among the schools um, if it does. Yeah. Ms. Minnick. So if, if they're already sort of elevating the level on which they're judging MCAS, right. will there be a correlation? Will you be able to take longitudinal data from MCAS into PARC and make sense of it? Will we be able to discern the accountability that the state has been looking for from districts? If it, I mean, if, if they were, uh, do we lose our cohorts? I mean, are the scores no. going to be so vastly different that we can no longer say, well, we, no, we've no. seen improvement in this? No. Or? no, actually, when we go over the scores, in fact, what I was doing today was kind of um, making a list of what the, what the actual changes are mean in real life. Um, and then it's, it's something I can share with <coughs> members of the school committee. Um, they're keeping part of the MCAS, uh, the, kind, the way the MCAS was scored, um, or uh, under NCLB, the um, Composite Performance Index is basically what's, what it's called, but it's sort of a, uh, uh, the score that individual students achieve based on the <coughs> test. But what they've done is also added a different score instead of an AYP score. They've added, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget the name, but um, it's a PPI score, but that's the one that's the most critical now with the, under the new system, and that's how fast each school and district is closing the gap. And, and that seems to be a big focus is closing the gap. Mm -hmm. Is there also a focus on just value added for all students? Well, that's a sh supposedly in the growth model, which is part of the um, calculation for that PPI score. Okay. Um, as concerns implementing the Common Core, it, um, I just encourage the district to look to see if there's a role that the collaborative could play. Collaborative is going to play a big role, I think. Good. Um, and because one of the nice things about what's happening now, one of the nice things about having Massachusetts <coughs> be part, you know, actually almost a leading part of this process. And unusual, in my experience as an educator, there's, they're really working hard to make the teacher evaluation system, the uh, curriculum frameworks, and the testing all aligned. So they're not in competition with each other. They're all really covering the same, they have the same expectations, people are being measured on the same things, so that there's a lot of co cohesion in um, the model. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about the curriculum? Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. <coughs> thank you, John. Okay, the next uh, item on the agenda is uh, uh, Mr. Flynn with a SPED liaison report. Um, so I met with the SPED PAC uh, recently to listen to concerns and develop a plan for meeting uh, throughout the school year. And I just want to report a few key highlights from our plan. Also, Kate Rowan is here from the SPED PAC, and she's going to talk to us about the goals that they've set. It's a good way for us to uh, all get to know Kate. And uh, so with that, I will go ahead. Um, so basically, we met. Um, some of the key concerns that were shared from the SPED PAC uh, was a sense of uh, a lack of transparency around um, some of the processes that happen within special education, um, reports of phone calls not being returned in a timely manner, um, and basically a general sense that they're hearing from parents uh, being reported to the SPED PAC that the process of spe special education is really daunting um, for parents entering that for the first time, and that wondering if the district can do a, a better job of communicating um, the whole process and, and what parents' role is in the team and trying to get a way to, uh, have a way to help parents understand that process better. Um, and there's still, uh, although we've made some progress and things have definitely improved, um, there still seems to be a sense of us versus them. That's what we reported out. And um, there is excitement among the pack about working with the new SPED director and also excitement about having uh, a collaborative relationship with school leaders and it's something that we're all looking forward to, to doing. I met with Brian and Lori 
and we had a meeting by phone to discuss all of these issues and there were no surprises there are things that have been are being addressed and um, Brian's well aware of it and um, yeah so anyway so we, we are going to be meeting on a regular basis and depending on what the board would like I can give you know, bi-monthly meetings or you know, a couple of times a year um, meetings on what's going on with PAC. But I would like to recognize Kate Rowan for a moment. Um, SPEDPAC met to set their goals for the year and I think it's helpful for us to know what their goals are and so she's going to present them to us. Thanks Kate. Um, so our goals for this year include um, developing a relationship with the PAC um, school committee liaison and the new administration. Um, to monitor and report on the effect of the cuts to SPED services that were made for FY13, including the ETL cut at the high school and the restructuring of the ETL position at the middle school, um, as well as the elimination of the reading interventionists, which all uh, specifically affect SPED. Um, we hope to encourage the administration and the school committee to develop a plan for high quality research based programs that exist in district to serve the significant SPED populations that we have in the district. And we hope to provide information and analysis to the district and school committee, including conducting a parent survey and analyzing expenditures of populations and out of district programs. We're already working on the last item. Um, based on uh, DESC data, in 2002, 25% of our special ed dollars uh, went to out-of-district placements. In 2011, 42% of those uh, special ed dollars went to out-of-district placements. I've met with the superintendent to talk about our interest in understanding where Northampton is sending the many students it sends to segregated spe special education schools, and we've requested data that can help us understand these trends. Um, the PAC is hoping that the district will, uh, with this new administration and some new energy, will start to develop high quality programs that can stem that tide and can allow our children to attend school with their siblings and neighbors while bringing in tuition from smaller communities that are less well positioned to develop programs. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Is that concludes my report. Okay. <laughs> So we'll now move on to the uh, superintendent evaluation. I'll turn the floor over to Vice Chair. I suggest for um, for you and the audience and anybody at home that you sit back and relax because as the superintendent let everybody know in his weekly musings, this is six pages long. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, I'm going to read from, I'm not ad living here, I'm, I'm reading from the report that uh, be self <clears throat> it is my privilege and honor to present this year's evaluation summary for Superintendent Brian Salzer. The school committee has utilized a very different tool this year than ever before, driven by the changes in the evaluation process at the state level. We have each filled out, each of us in the school committee, have filled out a questionnaire concerning <coughs> 10 key elements chosen by the superintendent with <coughs> representatives from school committee who made up the evaluation team. This has been a very collaborative and open process in which we determined which measures to evaluate the superintendent on after the first year in our district. This year we also had the added benefit of feedback shared by over 200 administrators and staff members. All employees of the Northampton Public Schools were given the opportunity to anonymously weigh in with their perspectives, thoughts, and concerns about the superintendent's performance. School committee members were then able to read all of the scores and comments that were submitted before writing up their own evaluations. As vice chair, I then took all of the forms from staff and school committee members and compiled this summary, which was then reviewed by the other <coughs> members of the evaluation team to be assured that the summary is an accurate portrayal of the data collected. We then shared this summary with the superintendent before bringing it public tonight. This has been a learning year for us as we are using new tools, completing surveys online for the first time, and conducting the evaluation process in open meetings. For first effort, I think we've done very well. There were only a few minor technical glitches along the way that we'll correct for next year. I would first like to acknowledge and appreciate Superintendent Salzer's willingness, even eagerness, to be the first in the district to utilize the new state evaluation tool. His self-assessment, presented here a month ago, was exemplary role modeling of what will be asked of the rest of our staff. It is a statement of his professionalism that he chose to trial this model for the district. It will also help him identify with the rest of the staff and better understand the challenges of fulfilling the assignment. 
The 10 elements we measured were taken from the four key standards on the superintendent rubric. Each standard is broken down into more specific indicators, which are then further separated into individual elements. Please note that there are a total of 42 elements we could have chosen from, all of which are important areas for any superintendent to focus on and for a district to be mindful of. Through careful study and discussion, we chose those we felt to be most critical as we consider the distinct needs of, and concerns for Northampton, especially as we support a new superintendent in our district. The first standard is instructional leadership. Within this standard, we looked at six elements within the five indicators. Under instruction, we chose diverse learners' needs in which 100% of us rated the superintendent to be proficient. School committee members commented on the instructional rounds that the superintendent has modeled in the six schools, looking at, in part, the needs of all our learners. As early as in his entry plan, Brian focused on identifying areas that need attention to increase achievement for our students at all grade levels and across all subgroups. Throughout the year, he has worked with the administration, administrative leadership team, as corroborated by their feedback, to study and address the defined needs, to establish <coughs> goals and practices, to decide on action plans, as well as how to evaluate achievement. Brian has effectively communicated to us about these plans and addressed them in the budget as well. Under the indicator for assessment, we looked at adjustment to practice, which is defined as the superintendent's leadership of his administrative team to measure student learning. 100% of us rated the superintendent as proficient. It would seem that a significant amount of the time spent in alt meetings is focused on just this. The superintendent is dedicated to using the data at our disposal to measure student learning, growth, and understanding. And with the recent hiring of a new instructional technology director, it is clear this will be addressed comprehensively. His staff, who all gave ratings of proficient or exemplary, commented on the productive use of time in their meetings, and in fact, have agreed to meet more often to make more efficient and effective headway in their work. Under the indicator for evaluation, we looked at two elements, educator goals and observation and feedback. On the first, Brian received 80% proficient and 20% exemplary ratings, and the latter 90% proficient and 10% exemplary. It is noteworthy that his administrative team scored him similarly, though with a higher percentage of exemplary ratings in both elements. In fact, this is true for most of the elements in this evaluation. What a profound testament to the support he has from these important leaders in our school district. School committee members and ALT members commented on the clarity of our new district improvement plan and how aligned the SMART goals are with this plan. We have further commentary on how well the superintendent supports his administrators in their own evaluation processes and in their professional development. They have found Brian to be respectful and encouraging, dedicated and focused. Brian instructs the principals in a new, more, instructed the principals in a new, more streamlined process in presenting their school improvement plans, and both the SIPs and the DIP are now more measurable and more concentrated on student learning and achievement. Under the indicator for data-informed decision making, we evaluated on the elements of school and district goals, as well as improvement of performance, effectiveness, and learning. The school committee scored both of these with 100% proficient ratings. The ALT team had proficient and exemplary ratings in both. ALT members stated that Brian has utilized the various audits that the district underwent this year to learn about the district, and they believe he is building an outstanding central office team to achieve their mutually determined goals. On entry into the district, Brian met with all stakeholders to gather as much information as possible to understand the broad perspectives held in Northampton about our schools. He has used this as data alongside the numbers and scores derived from tests and audits to most fully appreciate the Northampton Public Schools, its students and staff, its parents and community. He has been found to be a thoughtful listener, a strong advocate, and an assertive and respectful leader. The second standard is management and operations. We looked at one indicator in human resource management called induction, professional development, and career growth strategies and one indicator about the development of fiscal systems. With regard to the first element, there is a 100% rating of proficiency by the school committee. We are pleased to note that professional development is a high priority for Brian as he sets out to achieve district goals. He is aware and concerned about the areas in which our staff and administrators need training and development. With his recent hiring of Johanna McKenna as Interim Director of Curriculum Effectiveness, 
it is clear that the superintendent will be addressing these issues comprehensively. Northampton Public Schools will be working toward creating a cohesive and progressive professional development plan that will meet the needs of all staff, not just teachers. Some staff members have commented that this is an area that needs serious attention. Others seem to be in a wait and see mode as Brian becomes more of a known entity to them. I have no doubt that they will see significant progress in this area as Brian works with the administrative team to implement a more complete professional development plan. Brian has also fostered a positive working relationship with human resources to help align our policies and procedures so that staff will be best served as they take advantage of professional development opportunities outside the district. With regard to fiscal systems, school committee has scored the superintendent as 70% proficient and 30% exemplary. There is no doubt that we are impressed with how Brian has come to understand the fiscal realities of our district in this past year. He has fully utilized his prior experience as a school business manager while working closely with our own new business manager, Mark McLaughlin, to develop and present a budget that would meet the extent extensive needs of our district. In fact, he developed a th three-tiered budget which outlined not only what we can afford, but what we truly need in order to be the exemplary school system our children deserve. But Brian presented this budget in many forums at all of the schools and at City Council in an effort to educate the Council as to why we are asking for increased funds, opening a citywide conversation about financial support for our schools. His budget demonstrated a clear understanding of Northampton's needs and the direction we intend to take. It is aligned with district goals and priorities. His administrators have found him to be a strong advocate as well as fair, meticulous, supportive, respectful, and genuinely co collaborative as he sought their input in the process of developing the bu budget. The majority of staff also found this year's presentation to be excellent and commented on the inclusive nature of the budget planning through consistent communication in the buildings. One staff member hoped that the superintendent and the school committee would work together to become, quote, courageous advocates for public education. The third standard is family and community engagement. We focused on the element community and business engagement with the, within the indicator for engagement. 70% of the school committee has found the superintendent to be proficient in this category, while the other 30% have scored him as exemplary. As a group, we have found Brian to be out and about, present and engaged, visible and available. Some members suggest that in the coming year, Brian reach out more to our business community to create rela relationships that will assist the district in achieving our goals. One member commented on the occasional discrepancy between intention and presentation at public meetings, hoping he will relax into the public part of this role as he becomes more familiar with us. He is also fostering a more positive relationship with our unions. A significant majority of the staff have been very aware of his presence in the schools, one commenting that his, vis vis his visibility has been thrilling and validating. In general, we are impressed with the remarkable way in which he has begun to develop relationships with so much of the community in such a short amount of time. The fourth standard is professional culture. We focused on the indicator and element for commitment to high standards. School committee members indicate that the superintendent may not have rated himself adequately enough on this measure. We had a 50-50 split between the proficient and exemplary scores. As a group, we have found Brian to be excellent at fostering a commitment to high standards for teaching, learning, and achievement. One example, as previously mentioned, is the comprehensive way in which the superintendent presented his self-assessment, which sets a very high standard for the rest of the district as they all begin to perform their own self-assessments. His administrators seem to agree with our rating and have commented on his integrity, dedication, intelligence, and compassion and have also found him to be an excellent role model for professionalism. Staff, too, have been pleased and have felt respected as the authorities in their classrooms and have found Brian to be a good listener, supportive and exciting, focused on student achievement, responsive and inspirational. In conclusion, we, the Northampton School Committee, are very pleased with our superintendent's first year with us. What a remarkable first year this has been. From the moment he arrived, and in fact even beforehand and every day since, Brian has been a dedicated, enthusiastic, and optimistic leader. I am most gratified to learn that our administrative team and staff are as excited to be working with him as we are, and to, has found his first year to be so successful. From his entry plan, to his district improvement plan, to his end of year meetings with our staff, 
Brian has modeled a genuine dedication to this district. As I wrote in my own evaluation, I have been consistently impressed with his insights, his work ethic, his personal skills, his grasp of the issues, and his creativity in addressing them. I sincerely look forward to working with Brian in the coming year, and on behalf of the school committee, wholeheartedly support his leadership for the Northampton Public Schools. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for time and attention and the seriousness that you put into that evaluation. I really appreciate uh, all of your kind words and how comprehensive your comments were on my work. I truly love this job and I love working with you. You're actually a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Yeah, I know. I was, I was just brand new on the school committee when we were starting the search process. <coughs> and I think that one thing that was very clear is the search process. You know, we went through that process of figuring out what we were looking for, what we wanted to, you know, what the needs of the district were, and, you know, we ended up sort of thinking we're, we're going to really need somebody who would be quite ambitious. And um, I think you have been quite ambitious, and um, so I'm very pleased that uh, at least after one year, what we what we said is what we really need, I think we've, we've gotten. Right? Any other comments or about the evaluation? Okay. All right. So, uh, is there any old business? Any new business? Okay. Uh, the only future business meeting date uh, in September is a rules and policy subcommittee meeting on September 19th. That's from 1 to 4. Uh, yes, it's I think it is. Office. 1 to 4 in the superintendent's office. Okay. Uh, now, we have um, the next item is uh, is an adjournment, but we um, have a scheduled uh, executive session. Uh, and um, so I will, I will ask for a motion to adjourn, but after adjourning the open session, uh, well, we'll go ahead. We just adjourn into, I move adjourn. that we adjourn into Sign. executive Second. session. As long as we have, we have to be to clear that we're. I'll, I'll, say, I'll state that, but can we just adjourn into? You want to get this contract signed. You're right going to sign, you're going to sign contracts before executive yes. session. Yes, yes we will. Yeah. We're okay. going to adjourn and have a delay before opening into executive also session. But, but, but we will not okay. return. But we cannot, but we need to make it clear before we leave open yes. session that we're not going to return to open yes. session. So we have to make that clear. Um, so you really should make the motion that we're adjourning, but mm -hmm. that we move into executive session and state the reasons and all that stuff. Sure. So I move that we adjourn to open session um, for uh, under Mass General Law Open Meeting Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A. Uh, two, for the purpose of discussing non-union contract negotiations with the superintendent, we will not be returning to open session. Second. This is technicality. You, you said you, you said home. you said open yeah. session. You meant executive yeah. session. Yeah. Beginning. Yeah. Executive yeah. session. You said adjourn into executive session. Okay. Right. Good. Good. So we're we're adjourning into executive session. Okay. So I'll, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Yes. Mr. Alden Bourne. Yes. Mr. Lou Duvall. Yes. Mr. Michael Flynn. Yes. Mr. Downey Meyer. Aye. Ms. Lisa Minnick. Yes. Mr. Howard Moore. Yes. Ms. Stephanie Pitt. Yes. Mr. Andrew Shelfo. Yes. Mr. Ed Hopkins. Yes. We are four of Okay, so the, the open session then is adjourned.